Hola a todos. Bienvenidos a Podcast y Para Mi. It's as much as I'm going to do. The podcast about film, culture, Thank politics, God. and Clint Eastwood, where we watch every film directed by and or starring American filmmaker Clint Eastwood and explore how they speak to their moment and this one. The show is hosted by two chicos. Is that right? Was that yeah. what I would say? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep. Those chicos. Me llamo. I call myself uh-huh. Jake Serwin. I'm one of the. Those chicos. Yep, I'm one of the chicos. My name is Ian Ryan. It's not bad what he's doing because he's not parroting the Spanish-speaking Mexican and from other Latin American country natives. He is, of course, parroting the big man himself, Mr. Eastwood. You're right. Uh, upon reflection, I was doing a bad <laughs> Spanish accent on purpose, and I yeah, right. and I knew that. Yeah, we yeah, both yeah. Knew that. Yep. How you doing? What's going on? I'm feeling I'm feeling funny. We had some audio problems up top, mm-hmm. and I'm just I'm a let's, little out of sorts. Which you know I'm kind of getting into. Let's the get a big of, round of applause for Jake to make him feel good today, folks. Huh? Okay. Hey, thank Everybody's you. Everybody's going wild. Thank you. Everybody's going ape shit. They're going yep. crazy on themselves. <laughs> uh, I'm good, man. I had a strange IRL week, but it was a balm to watch this movie. It was a bomb, yep. and it was a bomb. It was just nice. I, it was a good time. It actually did really well at the box office. Yeah, you're right. Good point. So I'm wrong. I, it's nice to get be wrong right up top in the episode. You had a, an IRL week, and I am IRL weak. Uh, not a strong man. That's <laughs> mm-hmm. not true, honestly. That's not true. I'm, no, it's not. I think I'm right. I'm like medium. I think I have a unremarkable level of physical I mean, strength. You're definitely not a La Strada style strong man. That's safe to say. No, I've never seen you like not, bend a metal bar or something. As far as I recall. At what point did they decide maybe the maybe the uh the big weight on the end of the bar should shouldn't be, be a, a globe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something interesting. I mean, in terms of keeping it in one place in the old gym or the home gym, terrible design, right? Well, but the new design is no no better. What are you talking? Oh, you're talking about a barbell? Yeah, I was thinking of a dumbbell. I'm talking right, about though. a barbell with the with the, yep. the discs. Nope. The you're plates. Right. Yes, yep. correct. No more notes. Clearly a couple of gym rats over uh-huh. here. Gym rats, of course, will be our guest on next week's <laughs> yeah. episode. Uh before we get too far into things, just wanna mention up top here for anyone who can't get uh anyone who doesn't want to listen to the full five hours of the episode to get to this part, we do have a Patreon where we talk about Clint movies from before Play Misty for Me and movies adjacent to Clint Eastwood. For example, the directorial outings of Sandra Locke. Uh, We'll talk about other stuff related to Clint. It's a whole lot of fun. It's only $5 a month. It gets you two episodes for $5 every month. That's at patreon.com slash podcasty for me. To quote the episode of The Simpsons where Bart gets like sent to France or something. Uh, My children need wine. Today we're talking about The Mule. Yeah. This is a good film and it made as much money. uh, Well, this is not going to make any sense. I'm going to keep saying, I'm going to finish the sentence. This made as much money as the 1517 didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Damn, all the money in the world between those two films. No, that's Ridley Scott. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. the, this is uh, Clint Eastwood's t- 2018 film, his second film of 2018. It's it true. came out about eight months after uh, the 1517 to Paris, which is uh, an avant-garde masterpiece. Yep. And this is Clint back in the acting chair. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> he's directing he's he's uh directing himself. Interestingly, Bradley Cooper on the set, but he is back in the acting chair, which of course we know is forbidden Banned by this from man. his sets. Yeah. Yeah. The man hates chairs. Uh-huh. He's uh he's a real I mean this is a this whole movie is a is essentially about uh, this whole movie is problematizing you got time to lean, you got time it's to clean true. mentality. Yep. And so it's interesting that Bradley Cooper is here. We'll get to all of this. First, we have to do our two questions. Yep. And I would like to go first. Please go right ahead. Now, this film is called The Mule. It's uh-huh. not about a mule. There That's are true. no mules on camera. Uh, no literal horse donkey, uh, sterile offspring on camera. Nope. But which two animals would you hybridize if you could? And Ooh. likelihood of success is a factor here in terms of winning the question. 
Okay, which two animals would I hybridize? You're looking at them, pal. Zero percent chance of success. The two of us, you mean? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I trust that for just the sake of, exclusively for the sake of uh, uh, scientific thoroughness, we Mm -hmm. would each try to impregnate the other. Of course. Of course. No, I'm going to give you a real answer. This week I was teaching some children about animals. Careful. Yep. And first of all, I was doing a bunch of research about whether we're still teaching kids reptiles as a group. Wait, what? Because it's got, I mean, it's like this old pre-modern version of taxonomy that was just based on describing morphological features that animals had in common. It's, it's bordering on like the compendium of beasts, basically, to say that reptiles... Well, well the, the book of beasts, yeah. I have that, by the way. It's very good. The <laughs> yeah. one where they, they include birds under the category of bees, I believe, well, or maybe the other way around. Maybe this, bir- maybe bees were a type of bird. Understandable. What I, My main point, in fact, is that birds should be reptiles if there is such a... They now well, use the phrase sauropsida. Sauropsida. Let me, blow your, let me blow your brains out the Do back it. of your head for a second here. Yeah, man. Um... It's all bullshit. It's all the all well, of these categories are are like uh, best best available descriptor. There I mean, and there's examples that break each and every one of them. It's true. You're talking to a, a guy who enjoys a rich discussion of Hegelian categories and how misleading they are for us uh, from an epistemological perspective. But no, the reason these are grouped together in modern taxonomy is because they have shared ancestors. That's how modern phylogenetic trees work. So. Birds and crocodiles are... Well, yeah, but everybody has shared ancestors well, at a certain true. point. Well, that's true. I was reading about this, how actually the fish is an extremely imprecise word because it just means like vertebrates, basically. So we are type of lobed right. fish. Well, but no. sometimes like another guitarist will sit in or whatever. Oh, that's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, R.I.P. Harris Whittles. And the real thing I wanted to say is in the course of all this learning about animals, I learned about something called a chysidian, I think. I don't know how it's really pronounced. This it's is the, the Mads Mikkelsen character from Dr. Strange. <laughs> I believe. That's right. He's got that Chysilius. stuff under his eyes that, you know, is making him a bad yeah, boy. Yeah. He's got, his eyes are becoming pixelated somehow. Uh, no, this is like the third type of amphibian besides frogs and salamanders. It's like a little mucus snake. It looks like a worm, but it mostly eats worms. Big worm that eats other worms. It's awesome. Now, this is when your your computer had turned off and you were looking at the black screen like a type of mirror. That's right, Charlie. That's right. Mucus worm. Uh, no, wait. Hold on. What? Look it up. Do you have an example of this? No, I don't know what. This is, you've, this is everything I know about them. I just learned about them a few days ago. Okay. So, anyway, how old were the children that you were trying to, you're trying to get they into were... some Derridian uh, uh, post-structuralist animal taxonomy uh, with six and seven six and seven <laughs> <laughs> like you could go ahead and just tell them that reptiles exist uh, that's man. basically what i did but then i started talking to them about birds and they all knew it already these kids are just smarter man i'm I, we should be hopeful for the future whitney houston that's cool because they, they had already heard this bird news so i guess i would combine one of these mucus snakes with something enormous in order to make an enormous mucus snake you know like a I guess an elephant, probably. Hold on. Because I recently heard a story about a group of men. <laughs> I heard this one as well. Who yeah. encountered an elephant. <laughs> or did they? And they all, they all took away very different ideas about yep. it. Yep. I like this. I'm not going to ask any further questions because okay. this has gotten so stupid so quickly. <laughs> but uh, for me, it uh-huh. w- really would have been good for me to... Prepare something? Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, how could you have known? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would do... <laughs> uh... <sighs> I would crossbreed a carpenter bee with a mud dauber wasp oh, to, wow. to advance their constructive capacity. Yeah. Because then we can get kind of a wooden daub mm-hmm. home Beautiful. going. Beautiful. Eventually, I love this. Eventually, we're finding entire cities, mm-hmm. glass and steel construction <laughs> among the, the bees. Frank Lloyd Wright bee. Yep. Which we are, it's, it is a type of bird, but like uh-huh. bee, yep. or vice versa. We got it. Great. Good question. Next. What is, you already mentioned how this relates to the film, but what is the most humiliating job you've ever done for money? I was a temp working over like 4th of July weekend for like two or three days Uh 
at a kind of co-working space uh, in downtown Los Angeles because there was a like a, a window of licenses opening up for marijuana oh, dispensaries. Damn. Leo Sharp. Yeah. And uh, the company uh-huh. had hired a bunch of temps to basically be like one of those guys with a hundred iPhones open all at once to to farm out the the likes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But what we were doing is because when the, when the window opens, you have to manually type in all of this information at once and hit enter. And so they had us all just like running drills and the, the fastest ones of us, of which of course I was one. Sure. Were taken aside and the guys from running this were like, we're going to have you, work on a special uh like a special set of of licenses wow that were like for their friends okay high priority licenses yeah they explained that this was like it was a specific kind of license that i think was at least intended as a sort of restorative justice thing you had to be a person of color who had been uh, uh previously in contact with the criminal justice system as a result of marijuana uh, marijuana possession and i'm sure everything you were doing was in the spirit of this law absolutely there weren't any there weren't any guys who looked exactly like dj collett um Mm -hmm. (laughs) there were like five of them and i did it i remember on the day of first of all it was the day that kevin hart got in that really bad car accident wow and the whole time we were like waiting for whatever 8 a.m when the thing opened the the guy who was like helping me who in my my mind the guy was sort of the ring ring leader of this thing in my mind he just was lp the white guy from run Uh the jewels like because he looked yeah he was telling me like yeah man like he's not gonna walk again like it's really bad (laughs) just (laughs) i don't know why but i I don't (laughs) care about this like it's upsetting to me well i'm sorry that happened to any human being right Yeah, yeah but like i'm not i don't i don't really think about kevin hart that much yeah and then when when it was time to do it i did it as fast as i could and hit enter and the guys were like jumping up and down and like hugging me and stuff. And I had a very distinct sense that I had forgotten something. Um, <laughs> and I never heard from any of them again. So that's the beauty of the temp job. You know, you're, you're in and out. It's just a little slice of life. It's like a, just a Jarmish moment with somebody in a taxi, but it's you uh, exactly. debasing yourself. Yeah. 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 Uh, Helsinki day and night or what night? Yeah. What's yep. it called? I don't Yeah. It's something like something that. Something like that. That's my most demeaning job. What's yours besides the podcast? Uh-huh. You don't get paid. Uh, unfortunately, I've done a number, so I'll just pick one kind of at random. I also tempt, I tempt at a catering job, which feels like, you know, this is like Russian dolls, Russian nesting dolls of temporary work, basically. But I was serving at the Salesforce holiday party. You sure were. Yep. Yeah. Slay I was, queen. Uh-huh. Yeah. I wish I'd been serving something, but I was just serving mucus worm, I guess, because I was just wandering around all these tech bros. And wouldn't you believe it? Oh, having, you, you, were the, you were passing apps? I was passing apps. That's exactly right. I was, oh, I was FOH okay. front of house. Uh, so I was nice. refilling stuff, passing apps. I wish you would, you would get the FOH. <laughs> yeah, man, me too. Of course, I did run into some people that I knew because I am from silicon valley and i was not embarrassed to be working a working class job while they were working something that probably paid them one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year minimum starting to make a salary. product that no longer exists correct and maybe never did yeah yeah because in fact i knew that i should not be embarrassed because my job was more real than their job so right uh i was just embarrassed by just the conjunction of these two things the thing that i didn't really want to be doing and now being in a social position where they don't quite know how to treat me because they do want me to go get more apps but also <laughs> i more little tiny we went to high school or whatever together or something yeah but it was fine i think it's you know you get yelled at by a person the beauty of being a temp catering worker is that i knew i would never see any of these people again so i got into a fight with somebody about venezuela just for fun nice. basically just to pass some time uh you know it's 2016 or something uh and yeah we'll say that was it i don't know if it was the most immoral job that i've ever done but just nice and low where they like us i mean look i don't i don't mind that mm-hmm. do you remember any kind of any of the apps that you had no absolutely not don't remember okay 
any of that business. Extraordinary conclusion to the story. Thank you very much for that, <laughs> yeah, that question, sure, Ian. Man. It's time for us now to transition into talking about the mule. The mule. Now, this is, of course, as I mentioned, a Clint Eastwood film directed by. It was released December the 14th, 2018, eight months after the 1517 to Paris. Mm-hmm. Two months after Bradley Cooper's A Star is Born is yep. released, which is a, for a long time, a, a gestating as a Clint project. And we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a little bit. This film is, well, let's, you know what? Because of the nature of the subject matter, mm-hmm. let's go back to an old standard. Let's tell the people where they can watch the film. Okay. All right. So if you're in the United States and you want to watch The Mule, we recommend that you do, by the way. Mm-hmm. It's available to stream on Netflix. The classic Netflix. This is one of the more available recent Clint Eastwood films. And it's also available for rent and purchase on all your favorite platforms, including apparently you can buy it on AMC Theaters On Demand for $5. Okay. And then I guess it lives in your AMC app on your phone. Until that gets deleted someday. Yeah, sure. Uh, Now, if if someone was down there in Mexico, the old country, they call it, where would they watch this film? They would find it, like you're saying, uh, lots of places, including streaming for free with a subscription on Prime Video and HBO Max, on Claro Video, on Amazon at a low price, and also on Apple TV. Funny you should say that, because I recently found out that they call it something else down there. They call it Monsana TV (laughs) in Mexico. Uh, also, I understand that in, in Mexico, uh, Claro Video is actually called Clear Video. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all backwards down here. <laughs> New joke alert. Yeah, well, yeah. it's because it's south of the equator. Yep. Yep. I was about to say Mason-Dixon line, which is tex- technically true. And it's I mean, technically it true. Mason- it's, it's also... Fucking... Cr- <laughs> God damn it. Piece of shit. Uh, yeah. Now, this tells the story. This is a film based on a New York Times article from 2014 called The Sinaloa Cartel's 90-Year-Old Drug Mule by Sam Dolnick. Sam Dolnick, if you, if you look this man up, is uh, he's one of those people who every single person in his family also has a Wikipedia page because he is related to the publishing family of the New York Times, the Soulsburgers. Yeah. His mother, so he's like a great-grandson of Arthur Hayes Soulsburger. And his wife, Iphigene Ox Soulsberger. Of course. Yep. When you're related to somebody named Iphigene, you know you got you had a comfortable childhood. That's right. Yep. And then he seems to have been, you know, he like went to Georgetown Day School, which is probably where he, you know, he probably went there with like a couple of president's kids or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, fuck. I'm putting things together now. What happened? You know who else went to Georgetown Day School? Is Ruben Fleischer, oh, director of Zombieland, interesting, and interesting. Gangster Squad, and Uncharted, and of course Venom, mm-hmm. uh, and also almost director of this film. Yeah, first and man to this film. A, yeah, probably as a producer. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, anyway, he this guy then I think I get the sense that Sam Dolnick then tried to kind of Parlay get away this. from being. Um, oh, okay. F- being a fancy lad because he uh-huh. he becomes a foreign correspondent in Delhi for the Associated Press, and then he's like a sports editor for the New York Times, uh, but he covers like amateur cage fighting. Yeah, yep. So it, it seems like he tried to get dirty, which I, I I guess of all the things to do with your connections to the New York Times is one of the less objectionable than I could think of. Yeah, uh, I think what so do you think too. About this? I mean, I think interestingly. I- other rich kids, scions of rich families, have gone into journalism as a way to avoid, uh, like you're saying, being a fancy lad. And it doesn't really yep. work for this guy because that's his whole fancy laddom is related to journalism. Is journalism. Yeah. But uh, it seems like he was maybe yeah, trying some stuff out. I don't know. I don't know the man. Yeah. I don't know. He, he, won a, he won some kind of prize for covering privatized halfway houses in New Jersey, which is a good thing to definitely try to expose journalistically. Into. Although I haven't, I haven't read the article, so maybe he's nice to them. Who knows? <laughs> mm-hmm. Exciting new uh, halfway house venture in New yeah. Jersey. Yep. Worthy of attention. Private money will solve this problem. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. Doing a libel block, slander block. 
Yep. I have not. I didn't actually say that. It was nope. a joke. Slender block. I'm doing a, an X with my hands. Uh-oh. Like a ah, uh, lawyers hate this one weird trick. <laughs> uh, we'll just wait till they see my one weird tip. Uh-huh. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. He's talking about journalism, folks. So the article is pretty good. I I like it. It's pretty it. good. Yeah. It's short, but it's pretty good, and it's an exciting idea. Uh, yeah. It's about Leo Sharp, who was a World War II veteran who had, for it sounds like a decade been working as an extraordinarily prolific drug mule for the Sinaloa cartel, Often. which is oh, yeah, tell us. like the cartel. That's yes. like the one that is, and it's, it's the one that's effectively state aligned. Well, that, that's a trickier question. Nowadays, difficult to say. For a while, also during the time of Felipe Calderon, who initiated the most brutal period of the Mexican drug war or the Mexican extension of the U.S. drug war, as I like to call it. Uh, Mm -hmm. He may have had some other associations, which is why he was doing all this nasty stuff. But uh, yeah, you're talking about, of course, the fact that the Guadalajara cartel, which existed in the 70s and 80s uh, into the, well, maybe I think the 80s, uh, into the turn of the 90s, uh, collapsed when it's sort of like founding leader who had the other cartels in a peace agree- agreement. Uh, this guy named uh, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Uh, he was arrested. Then his whole organization splintered. Of course, our friend El Chapo Guzman creates the most powerful uh, sort of like inheriting force without being the same stabilizing force in Mexico, which is the Sinaloa cartel. Yeah, well, this is going to be ian's shining moment this is really like this is the the episode where i'm relying entirely on ian as opposed to the other ones where i'm relying 90 percent on Ian. Uh uh-huh that's very generous of you i think we both lean on each other which is a foolish decision (laughs) to two clowns (laughs) asking the other you ever see like a a cub scout try to try to prop up two sticks Uh into a pyramid for to start a fire (laughs) exactly yeah yeah. uh yes my expertise is of course not in cartels or drug war stuff but i have learned about it both uh personally and indirectly sure has folks he is high right now to paraphrase (laughs) denzel washington Uh yep so this guy he's a world war ii veteran who was a previously a a day lily a uh, hybridist and, and and renowned for his uh, his day lilies. People would apparently come on buses to his farm in uh, Michigan City, Indiana. Uh-huh. Love that detail. <laughs> yep. Every single time, uh-huh. it's funny. It is Kansas City, Missouri, Michigan we City, Indiana. Can't help ourselves. Las Vegas, Texas, I think, or there's a Los Angeles, Texas, maybe. Okay. They're always, it's always funny. Yep. Did I tell you that I went to high school with a girl whose father was from Lebanon and whose mother was from Lebanon, Pennsylvania? No, is that true? Is that a true That's fact? That's true. Whoa. Yeah, true fact. Although all those foreign cities and countries that have a place named after them in the U.S. are just, just disgusting distortions of how you would imagine anybody could say this word. It's just shocking. Right, like Cairo, uh-huh. Indiana, <laughs> or... Yeah. Illinois or something. Lima. Yeah, there's, there's a place yeah, called Cairo. This, yeah, Lima, yeah. Or Ohio. I guess it's to try to distance themselves from unwhite people. Uh-huh. I would imagine is the problem. Yeah. Yep. Is unwhite any less gross than non-white? I was just trying it out. I don't know. It's worth consideration. Certainly, you can become kind of a Leo Sharp figure, just navigating your way blindly, trying to make your slurs not slurry. You know, somebody looking at a CAT scan of Leo Sharp's brain and my brain saying these are the same <laughs> picture. Where's the where's the other guys? Yeah. Much like the character in the film, he uh, was having financial problems with his his flower business. The in the article, they specif they they sort of use the metonym of the size of his printed catalog that gets mm-hmm. shorter and shorter and eventually is printed in black and white and then like disappears entirely. The Internet is partially to blame. Um and just like the real, or just, I was going to say, just like the real Earl Stone, just like uh-huh. the fake mule, yep. he uses a Lincoln Mark LT pickup truck and transports cocaine from the southern U.S. border to the Detroit, Michigan area rather than the Peoria, Illinois, and uh-huh. Chicago area, Often as, it's as depicted in the film. 250, 200 kilograms per month of cocaine that he's transporting. Yeah. Sometimes money as well, large amounts Mm -hmm. of money. And uh, in October 2011, he is pulled over 
by the Michigan State Police, and they find 200 kilograms of cocaine. It's about 440 pounds of cocaine in his pickup truck. There's a dash cam video of the arrest that the New York Times published. I don't like when they do this. I think this is exploitative and gross, and no one is at their best when they're being pulled over by the police. Obviously, the dash cam footage, I think, can be very useful in prosecuting law enforcement jackholes who uh, abuse people or break the rules or um, sometimes kill them dead for no good reason. But don't publish that in the New York Times. Come on, man. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Often, I wish it would be more useful in the prosecution of of corrupt cops or just cops uh, generally. But oftentimes, I think you're right. It gets passed around. It's unclear how much it it generates sympathy for the people who are being mistreated versus just saying like cops have such a hard job. And I think, you know, the majority of, of dash cam footage that gets shared is not even to those ends. It's just out of like cops, uh, bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do type of like, you know, these criminals are so crazy in parentheses. These people of color are so crazy. Right. Uh, right. The video itself, I will say, is extremely charming and shows how well they captured his spirit in the film. He can't hear them or he is pretending to not be able to hear them at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. It's a really good yeah. technique. Yeah. Uh, when one of the cops says to him, now my, my dog identified the bed of your truck uh, as having narcotics. Why would he have done that? And Leo Sharp says, I don't know, maybe your dog likes narcotics. <laughs> 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 really really funny thing to say uh yeah i mean we should be asking ourselves like why do these dogs even get into this line of work in the uh -huh. first place yeah what are their also, motives they lift the dog up into the bed in a very like clumsy way which made me think about the tragedy of all dogs being forced to work for cops uh right but yeah generally i think it highlights the ridiculousness of this man having been in a position where he works for the cartel the ridiculousness of treating him like a dangerous criminal, uh, all of it comes forward, and many maybe his and the, canniness and in, in sort of like working his angle a little bit as well, and the the genius of right. uh, contracting an extremely old white man to Truly. be a drug mule because there are so many tools in his uh, yeah. Swiss Army knife, yeah. as we see in the film, they use basically all of them. Yeah, uh, and so he gets picked up. He. Is also a fabulist. He claimed to have owned an airline in the 70s. He claimed to have planted flowers in the Rose Garden for George H.W. Bush. Claims a lot of stuff. It's unclear if he had dementia or if he was just really good at playing dementia yes. or a little bit of both. And he also notably from the from the video, you can tell that there's sort of two two roads diverge in an old man's larynx and you either get the, the Clint like this or you get the Leo Sharp like, uh, yeah. you know, snoring for 50 years, really deep voice. <laughs> and so he has one of those. Yeah. And uh, it's just nice to hear. I don't know. It is. You know, it, at his trial. Oh, he, yeah. He, <laughs> this is like, I can't, it's, it's either insanely funny or one of the saddest things I've ever heard. It's, it is. It is those things. You're right. He had a daughter. He has a or had a daughter. He passed. He died in in 2016, December 12th, 2016. He had a daughter who lived in Hawaii and apparently had a enjoyed a fairly good relationship with her. So that part is a little, uh, fabricated a little bit for the the film. But at his sentencing hearing, he says, "I'm really heartbroken. I did what I did, but it's done." Mm -hmm. Which is a very Earl Stone way of seeing things. And he also made a plea to the court that instead of serving time in prison, he could. <sighs> Pay the five hundred thousand dollar penalty he owed the government by growing Hawaiian papayas. And what did he say? Quote: It's so sweet and delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is so cute. My girlfriend was also overwhelmed by this news to hear that uh, this man was really just like being exactly what you would expect. And it, I think, it's such a beautiful blow to the carceral system to see. Like, first of all. Yeah, he should do that. That sounds great. You know, this old man wants to well, just use his horticultural skills to spread the wealth of Hawaiian papaya. Great. It doesn't, the, the irony is not lost on me at all, although it seems 
to have escaped Sam Dolnick's magnifying glass, that his both of his careers involved driving plants around, yep. driving plant products around. Correct. Exactly I mean, right. He had one career, basically. He did. He just had sort of a shift of focus. And the defense was trying to argue that he had dementia. Which, after he was incarcerated, he did have dementia and was released. Right. He got compassion. After only serving after a year. A year yep. And then dies like a year later of natural causes, being 92. So uh-huh. Clint is beating Leo Sharp. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he is buried at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific in Honolulu because he was a World War II veteran. So, we salute you, Leo Sharp. He had we big do. mutton chops. Uh huh. He looked uh kind of like what's the name of the guy who was in a bunch of Clint Eastwood movies? Mark Margolis. He looked oh, yeah. a lot like Mark uh-huh. Margolis. Actually, yep. Would have been a good performer in the Ruben Fleischer movie of this that would have sucked shit and ass. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, the the like badass version of the story. Right. With I, I would imagine like a lot more threesome scenes. Mm-hmm. Somehow. <laughs> that's right. but anyway, that's that's Leo Sharp. This movie is written by Nick Shank. Hey, big Nick He's Shank. Back, is folks. Back. Nick Shank, who wrote Gran Torino, which weirdly moved the action of the inspiration from Minnesota to Detroit. This. Yeah. And this film moves it from Detroit to Chicago, Peoria. Very strange. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Nick Shank also writes Cry Macho. And say it with me, he also wrote. The recent streaming hit, A Christmas Story of Christmas. Of Christmas Story Christmas, yep. Starring Ralphie. He's uh-huh. back, folks. Adult. After producing Iron Man and starring <laughs> briefly in Iron Man as a scientist. Yeah. Peter Billingsley is back. He is back on his bullshit, and I mean that in <laughs> the complimentary sense of, look, he's got yeah. some sense of how to use an old man and talk about thematic elements that are extremely relevant to all of Clint's filmography that that get in conversation with his past work. I mean, I think this is a, I think this is a, in fact, much more complicated and nuanced and successful corrective to Gran Torino. I agree. I agree with that. Although to be clear, I think this film is very, very good with some dips in quality that we'll, we'll talk about that I think particularly in the way they treat some of these themes, I think it can be uneven. There's real highs and then there's some moments of fumbling, I would say, a little bit. But I think Nick Shank has gotten better. He must include a scene where Clint says some like a chronological slurs that surprise people of color and they have to react to what he has just said. Absolutely. But the twist here is that they're totally accidental and used in a very friendly and helpful way. Mm-hmm. And so he's completely off the hook for forgetting for somehow missing that you're supposed to call black people black yeah no now, i think it or, the whole scene is well people. is well done in fact in the movie because the black people are very humanized i mean earl sharp uh earl stone i should say comes off looking more foolish than they do you know it's not not sort of like ha 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 these people have to listen to this humiliating yeah. word uh, we got to get to, we'll get to this scene and when we get to it, cause I have right. another thing I okay. need to point out. Let's save it. If that's okay. Yep. Um, so uh, another, uh, another couple of words on, on the crew, uh, Nick Shank, by the way, interestingly, he wrote on a few episodes of the anthology series Manhunt, which in its second season was about Richard Jewell that's and exactly Eric right. Rudolph. Yes. And he wrote a couple of episodes of Narcos, which I have not seen, but I imagine is garbage. Uh, in terms of like depicting the real world, I have seen all of Narcos, the original, and then also the first season of Narcos Mexico. Um, it is less bad than lots of drug war stuff previously in terms of highlighting like CIA interest in this and the corruption of the Colombian government, which is now has been back in power intermittently. Um, but it's still got a bunch of just nasty, really classic drug war stuff. Right. You know, this like ye- yellow a, filter. Cast a Brazilian guy. Yeah, it did. Yep. The, it's literally the Wikipedia page is called Mexico Filter, by the way. Great. For like yeah. that specific sepia traffic look. <laughs> uh huh. Anyway, we've also got so Tom Stern has moved on to yeah. shooting the Meg. 
and mm -hmm. working with uh, Robert Lorenz a couple more times. This was shot by Yves Belanger. I don't know. He's a French Canadian. So I think any way you pronounce his name is fair game. <laughs> he was primarily Jean-Marc Vallée's guy, the guy who did Wild and uh, that movie Demolition. And, and he does some Delon too, right? Is that, am I remembering correctly? Yeah, he does one Xavier Dolan film. I haven't seen any of those. That guy seems really annoying, to be honest. <laughs> um, and like the thing where the guy, I've seen the the clip where the the kid pushes the aspect ratio to the uh -huh. side, and yeah. that's yeah, that's like music video bullshit. That's yeah. some that's some Vimeo staff pick nonsense. Get out of here. <laughs> he also shoots a, a film called Indian Horse, which is a Canadian adaptation of a of a novel by a First Nations author. Produced by Eastwood, right? Produced by Eastwood, which we will eventually cover on the Patreon. Mm -hmm. It's about a, a kid who survives residential school to become a an ice hockey phenom. So, I don't know. And he also shot a movie that was a movie called North Star that last year was the directorial debut of Kristen Scott Thomas from her own screenplay. Interesting. Stars Kristen Scott Thomas, Scarlett Johansson, Frida Pinto, and Sienna Miller from wow. American Sniper. That's right, yep. Uh, seems to have vanished into the air. I don't know. So I guess we'll cover that on the show. <laughs> okay. And he's, uh, but he's also shooting Juror number two. So Yes, yep. There you go. Uh, that's Eve and Joel Cox is still in the editor's chair. Music by Arturo Sandoval, mm -hmm. who I know primarily from the Los Angeles Philharmonic calendar where he is yearly doing his uh, Arturo Sandoval Swingin' Christmas or Swingin' Holiday event. Great. Which seems to sell out as soon as I remember that it exists because <laughs> it sounds kind of good. Yeah. He is a Cuban-American trumpet player, band leader, composer. Uh, he has performed in the White House several times, which probably gives you a sense of what kind of Cuban-American he is. Yes. And he also overdubbed Antonio Banderas' trumpet playing in Mambo Kings. Whoa, so, I didn't see that. Hell yeah. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. There's not that much music in this film. No. And what music there is doesn't stand out, to be perfectly honest. I was happy that there was not that much music in this film. I yeah. historically think that unless he's got something really, really great cooked up himself or his son's on top of it, or it's like Honky Tonk Man, his last few films in their, their music choices, uh, I think tend to do better when they're paired back. I think that's that's probably right. I do think it's nice that, you know, maybe Clint just thought he needed a little bit of music for this and was like, let's get a jazz guy. Let's yeah. get like a famous jazz guy to work on this. Why not? Now, in the production design chair, this is very interesting to me. Oh. Kevin Ishioka, we have not talked about this. He, he was a production designer on 1517 to Paris. Production designer on this, on Richard Jewell. Also works as art director on Deep Rising, the Stephen Sommers film that's quite fun. Uh, the Negotiator, uh, John Woo's Wind Talkers, The Chronicles of Riddick, hell of an art directed film. Mm -hmm. Flight Plan, Next, which is the movie where uh, Nick Cage has like uh, premonition powers yes. and sees yep. Jessica Biel uh, tied to a wheelchair that explodes. Um, <laughs> G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra. Interestingly, this man who production designed this film, art directed Sully also, supervising art director on Avatar. Whoa. Isn't that okay. crazy? Yeah. This is a film that is, you know, you just need to pick a truck, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Maybe it's nice to do a bit of this after you've done Avatar. I suppose. Yeah. No, he also worked on uh, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, and Rebel Moon Part mm, 1. Okay. Worked so on Dunkirk. Snyder Man, huh? The Amazing Snyder Man. <laughs> Is that anything? So that's basically what we've got in terms of the front office over there yeah. at El Paso. And you were starting to say, so he gets grabbed by, by Ruben Fleischer, is with him for like a year or two, right? It doesn't seem doesn't go like anywhere. go anywhere. Yep. Uh-huh. Then Clint gets involved. Yep. Clint also brings along Bradley Cooper. Of course. Who claims that he's put himself on tape for every Clint Eastwood movie. And this one, Clint was like, hey, do you want to do this? And he said yes without... Uh, looking at the script. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, this is the same year as A Star is Born. In fact, two months after A Star is Born, which project originated with Clint. I think we should probably cover that on the Patreon. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes that sense. That film yep. and the production context. But anyway, uh, Cooper was 
probably the front runner to to star in that film when Clint was going to make it. Mm -hmm. Although basically everyone and their mother seems to have been in conversation for it. Uh, yeah. Clint at one point, so it was going to be Beyonce, then she got pregnant, and then Clint wanted Esperanza Spalding. Whoa. Which just, just, uh, that's real old white guy brain yeah, stuff. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, but anyway, no offense to her, the she's biggest, just not. No, no, no. I, like yeah, I don't think star, it is. star, you know. Yeah, to go yeah. from Beyonce to Esperanza Spalding <laughs> is a very interesting choice. Right. But we've got Clint as Earl Stone. I really love the beginning of this film where he oh yeah Me so too. we open on his his business is booming on his daylily farm uh and we open with him immediately being like saying some racist shit to a mexican guy who works for him yeah i'm with you that somehow magically this did not come off as gran torino fumbling maybe it's because i have a better sense and can conf sort of more confidently navigate like how white men interact with uh generally latino like farm workers or like garden hands and stuff um i think it uh was a nice balance of making jokes at both of the participants expenses and treating everybody humanely i don't know what do you think yeah i mean he t calls the guy's car a taco wagon or something but then he makes a couple of different jokes in spanish and you just get the sense that this guy, obviously, this sets up that he is familiar with working with Latino men. And he's like too comfortable. He, he's the kind of white guy who thinks he can't be racist because they're his buddies and he still is. But also the white guys know that he's well-meaning and have a complex relationship with him, guys. basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Thank you. Yeah. And then, you know, we get that scene later where after it all goes to shit, where he gives them money and he says, I w wish it could be more. Yeah. Yep. Which, you know, he, I guess at the very least, doesn't have to say that. No, no, no. Whether and that's I think true. At least the way that the guys act, it effectively communicates the idea that this is not like that syndrome where, you know, white parents think that a housekeeper is like a member of their family and the, the housekeeper thinks they're, they're like shitty employers, basically. But uh, right. they seem to just know that he's a guy in a tough situation and think that he's nice enough that they feel bad for him, basically. But he's not in the tough situation yet because first he's got to go to the day lily. Convention. That's right. Yep. Channeling a famous Minnesotan here. Can't tell you what hotel the convention is held at, uh -huh. but there are two trees involved. <laughs> yep. It's a Mitch Hedberg uh, -huh. uh He walks in and he is in ultimate swag mode. He's got the seersucker suit with the bow tie uh -huh. and the pocket square. That's right. And the little like uh, lapel pin thing of a flower. He's got the little straw trilby hat on. Yeah. He's got the sunglasses that are not formal somehow. Like this is such an old man look to just wear the truck stop sunglasses with a suit. Uh-huh. And it's so effective somehow as diverging from the cool that we have historically seen from Clint. This is a different type of charming. Exactly. Like a little bit clownish and ridiculous, but everybody still likes to engage with yeah, it. Yeah, he's right? a little dandyish. Yeah. But I think it's wonderful as a choice that I think we have to track throughout the movie, thinking about Clint as a charmer, as a man who's maybe been more concerned with like winning people over, uh, conquests, romantic conquests, uh, his own job, right? All these things that are also going on with Earl Stone, you know, seem to, to pair one to one with a lot of Clint's real life business. But it's not a recreation of Clint, which I think is much more interesting and a much uh, stronger artistic choice to say, like, this guy matches, but he is his own guy, a different type of guy. There's a sort of almost running joke. It happens twice, which is not quite enough. Where people think he's doing a Jimmy Stewart impression yes. when he's yep. just being himself. Oh, I totally disagree. Two was perfect for me. Three would I be too much. I don't think it reads properly, though. Like, I think it's not telegraphed exactly correctly. Like, it's 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 borderline confusing. It's true. It's true. It is. The, the way that it is approached, I think the second time it, it, it comes across a lot more clearly than the first. Well, it's because he reads a whole poem about his deceased dog. <laughs> Yeah. We we get here a I mean he does talk about how he misses his dog. I think that is it's the true. Dream. Yeah. For for more recent listeners of the show, I've been trying to guess the name that Ian gives himself on the the video call thing here. Today he's Molly B, which mm -hmm. I didn't have on my list. Who who'd you have on there? Okay, I've got a lot. Yep. Mr. Day Lily. Okay, of course. Biahito. Yeah, that was too easy for me. Too too King Pimpin. <laughs> yeah. Ben Gay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Dookie. 
Yep. Obviously. Of course. Uh, Mokoso. Uh huh. Ruko. Yep. Uh, Dr. Clark. That's the name of the cardiologist that he calls Says, out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe like glam cosmetology, just like mm. as a name. <laughs> Something I was guessing. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I've been on. Mark LT, uh-huh. which is the type of Lincoln. Yep. And then I also thought you might do something very funny and just call yourself the mule. Uh, that was my last guess. But it was well, good. Yeah, that is the strongest. Uh, I think that I probably had a slightly different relationship to all the Spanish nicknames because those are just sure. some things that I hear a lot. Uh, like yeah. hearing viejito is like not a special occurrence for me. Uh, that's not a brag. That's just a... Little old man. Right. Just something you hear all the time. People yeah. say at the market, look at that guy. That guy wants to pass you. Move out of the way for that guy, etc. He looks... Uh... He looks small. He looks shrunken for the first time. Like he oh. looks very old in in trouble with the curve. But no, it's a huge step. I don't know how many years trouble with the curve was. What seventeen? Twenty twelve. Oh, yep. So insanely wrong. So six years prior. Yep. Yeah, those were six aged aged years. It's ten years since Gran Torino. Yeah. Last yep. time he directed himself. Yeah, of course. He's looking shrunken, mm-hmm. but he still. Tells the ladies that they're on the wrong floor. The beauty pageant's on the third floor. Yep. Just a great, great gag. Yes. Um, he runs into the old, the old buddy I thought played you were by dead. Richard Hurd. Uh-huh. Yep. Who is, uh, yeah, the I Thought You Were Dead guy. He was also in uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Just, uh, and just like one of those faces. And yeah, so he's, he's king shit. He says, who needs the internet or whatever? Mm-hmm. And then smash cut to 2017. Oh, wait, no. We also have the wedding scene. We do, yeah. So th- then we cut to Allison Eastwood. She's back in front of the camera, back acting with... She is doing fifteen, seventeen shit here, uh, in my opinion, because she's, of course, so? acting out... Oh, oh, yeah. I thought you meant she was just acting poorly. No, 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 no. That's not no, what yeah, I mean at all. Sorry. Yeah, what no, I mean you're, is you're absolutely right. She is she being is, forced yeah. to replay her life's experiences of having Clint Eastwood be an absentee father but now she's doing it on screen in a dramatized way yeah she has done a tiny amount of acting since we last saw her in midnight in the garden of good and evil on this podcast she's been doing little bits of acting here and there a lot of tv movies and she in 20 uh, 2007 she directed a movie called rails and ties which okay. is uh seems to be one of the most depressing films of all time uh it's a lot of i'm just reading mentally ill widowed suicide mm, this accidentally yes. killed yeah breast cancer just like so much but it's ours kevin Olympic bacon stuff, and marcia sure. gay harden uh-huh. from uh mystic river we will be covering it on the patreon when we run out of stuff that sounds less depressing to cover <laughs> yeah but allison's back she is very weirdly cgi made up in this first scene i assume just so that she can look to have visibly aged it's so strange because it doesn't quite work either it's not even like irishman level right. so it she basically looks the oh, same it's, age it's she just, just looks, like a blur yeah exactly they just put like she, a digital blur on she her she looks forehead. like an yeah. oldish blur and then she just looks middle-aged in the, this the next part we should say she also looks perfectly fine she looks oh, yeah. very nice of course like, of course she's no. a, like a yeah and she looks her age very appropriately like yeah. maybe a little a little bit of work but nothing too crazy no 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 i think she looks lovely it which makes it all the stranger that this is happening right. and then she is saying her father's not going to miss her wedding and her mother played by diane weist who is uh doing too much in this film yes i well i i can't even blame it on her this is to me an a, a where the downfall of Clint's hands-off approach to directing comes in, his hands-off approach to script editing. Yes. Basically only about her storyline, but yes, go on. Her the, her and, and Tysa Farmiga, who we'll get to, are not done any service by this script. I, right. I'm as shocked as you are that Nick Shank can't write women, but um, <laughs> hey, come on. Uh, she explains, you know, he missed your whatever, your baptism, your your high school graduation, your first communion, your bat mitzvah, your when you won the Stanley Cup, you missed Correct. all those. Yep. yep. And why you think he's going to be here for the wedding? And he gets this fancy vase. He wins the award for the uh, shortest lived daylily or whatever. <laughs> uh huh. And says, "I'm." He's going to meet everybody in the bar. 
buys them all shots of Crown Royal while observing a wedding, an unrelated wedding party across the across the bar. So we we're we are acutely Asian aware. Asian wedding party, yeah, which I thought was a Grand Torino uh, connection, probably accidental. But just we we know that he knows effectively. You were telling me you you thought that they were all the same actors from Grand Torino. You were telling <sighs> me that they was not. Sometimes I must not play along, and I will not play along with you. All right. So then we cut to. 2017 yes farm looks like shit gotta be fun to look like shit up the set you know i mean pretty easy to do i will say especially if you've planted a bunch of things that just don't grow you know, well, yeah, like the, the the building looks like oh, it's kind yeah. of yeah, yeah yeah falling apart i bet it i is remember as fun, a you're right. as a child from uh watching like a documentary tv special on the indiana jones adventure at disneyland that mm. they would spray like spray adhesive on the walls and then just throw potting soil at them to just like get some dirt okay. to stick yeah. to the wall. Yeah, yeah. Chip in the paints, everything. You're right. Sounds like a good time. Yeah. You ever spray any adhesive? Sounds no. like fun. Not to my knowledge, no. And thank you for not No, I don't any kind engage of like, with that type yeah. of nonsense. Talk about Spider Man. <laughs> Remember that scene in Snyder Man? Yeah. I Toby Maguire is I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all falling apart. The internet's come and taken them away. I th- I think I find it interesting that they have said it in 2017 in the Trump era as opposed mm. to in the 2011 of the story in the in Obama and in prime occupy time. The only thing I could think about that was the expediency of like age and cell phone and car stuff, but you know what? I don't it's not like you know, Clint's never done period piece before. I'm not entirely sure what the motivation was for this micro shift. I don't know either, but it, it certainly takes some of the possible MAGA stink off of the film that looks on its surface like it could end up being that. It certainly no, is not. not There's no, no, no so. not a whiff of current like Republican right, bloodthirst in this right. film. So the farm's gone to shit. He's all the guys have to leave. He goes to. Now, the granddaughter, mm-hmm. played by Tysa Farmiga, yep. from The Bling Ring. Uh-huh. We all remember her being in The Bling Ring. We all remember her being in... I think she's in all of those uh, Ryan Murphy things. I think she's in I a lot of right. them. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Currently on The Gilded Age. And of course, <laughs> we got to <laughs> talk about this. Now, Tysa Farmiga, often confused for the daughter... Of uh-huh. Vera Farmiga. Yes, I've made this mistake myself. Because they are... Vera Farmiga is 21 years yep. older than mm-hmm. Tysa Farmiga. They are yeah. sisters, although I'm sure that there are some truthers out there. Sure, some Chinatown-style truthers. I didn't think someone was going to suggest that her father had impregnated yeah, her. I, I, you sick I guess fuck. I was just going to leave that in the... The fuck <laughs> is wrong with it? Get off the show. <laughs> no, come on. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's surprising. It's an age gap that would allow her to be Tysa's mother, but in fact, not the case. Yeah, she's a Ukrainian Catholic, or from a Ukrainian Catholic mm-hmm. family, which I would imagine is the kind of family setup that, that can lead sure. to... Uh, maybe not a ton of birth well, they control. They're not yeah. bagging yep. it up. Also, um, she's close friends... I'm seeing here, Vera Farmiga is close friends with Freddie Highmore, her co-star from Bates Motel, who played her son... But who is in real life godfather to Vera's Whoa. son? So she is mixing it up, Clint <laughs> style. Patrick Wilson also godfathered to her son, unless oh no, sorry, she's close friends of with course. Patrick Wilson, Conjuring verse, but not he's not the godfather. So which brings it to Jake's rant corner. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm prepared for this. Oh, I'm remembering. I'm I'm actually remembering why I'm feeling punchy okay. and weird today. <laughs> It's because, say it with me. I spent too much time thinking about Conjuring. Nope. Once again, and I think there was another episode in which this was the case, but last night I woke myself up screaming. <laughs> there was so, another episode like this. Man, what is happening over there? I had a, okay, I'll tell you about the dream. This is boring. Okay. It's a, I mean, telling, talking about dreams is boring and this is a particularly boring dream, but it's actually all the more interesting that I woke myself up screaming. In the dream, I had gone to see a movie and I had like left something at my seat and I had to go back and get it. I don't know, like a jacket or whatever. And I went back and the next showing had started and they were showing trailers. And one of the trailers was very scary. Okay. And so as I was walking to the seat, 
I wasn't scared. Like I didn't in the dream. I didn't feel scared, mm. but I just let out a scream <laughs> because there was something startling. Okay. And then I woke up and my girlfriend's like, "What? Are, what? What?" I was like, "Oh, sorry. I was dreaming about <laughs> being in a movie theater." You know what? I'm I'm big braining this this now extremely hacky comment about dreams being boring. Boring to share your dreams. It is. But in fact, it's not boring to express the love necessary to be interested in somebody in your life's dreams because they had an intense emotional experience to something that you will not be able to connect to. Be yeah. the bigger person. Show your interest in their emotions, not the event itself. Thank you so much. All That's right. very kind of you. So I'm so interested that you're a wacky little psycho and I love to know you. Thank you so much. Love you too, buddy. I uh, will remind you that we also have... Uh, people listening to this who don't yeah. give a shit though. So, so historically not something that's guided us to make the show. So the weird <laughs> fucking thing about Tysa Farmiga, uh -huh. she is also in the Conjuring films, yes. which star yeah. Vera Farmiga as uh, Lorraine Warren, a real life paranormal investigator. Mm -hmm. And so when the spinoff film, The Nun, which of course is about the scary nun from The Conjuring 2. Yep. And her origins, uh, initially haunting a Romanian nunnery. Uh -huh. When this film came out, Tysa Farmiga stars in it as Sister Irene. Yeah. And this character is of no <laughs> relation to Lorraine Warren, and of course can't be, because that's right. a real person, and yeah. you can't just make up relations that a real person didn't have. Well. But like, what the fuck? Yeah. There are two people who look extremely similar they have these giant wet blue eyes. Uh -huh. They're both the characters Le are made up similarly. Pillowy they're both features like, uh -huh, to their they're face. Both Christian. Yep. They both look Christian, and I mean that as a judgment neutral <laughs> yeah. comment. They're they're of of difficult to parse relationship to one another, and so now <laughs> you keep expecting that her sister, who seems like she should be her daughter, will be playing like her great her mother, or but she's oh, yeah, not. Yeah. Yep. And. Then also, there's a flashback in Conjuring 3 that's supposed to be to younger Vera Farmiga and Patrick Wilson, where I guess, I assume they went, oh, fuck, we <laughs> wasted Tysa Farmiga. We just yeah. got to get some blonde lady. Uh -huh. um, but it's insane because you have this woman who looks so much like her and is 21 years younger. Very precise. Yeah. It's so, so strange. Yep. So anyway, Tysa Farmiga is not that good in the movie. I think she's um, totally fine until she's called upon to really let it all out towards the end of the movie. Right. Uh, the scene in the hospital is particularly yes, that's the one I'm talking uh, difficult. About. Yeah. The Nun came out the same year as this. Wait, oh, what? Hey. Let's see what... Nun came out like, yeah, a uh, month, be uh, month before Star is Born. So three months before this. Mm. Around my birthday. I remember actually going to see The Nun for my birthday. Pretty bad Happy film, birthday. but I had a good time. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Same to you. <laughs> Thank you so um, much. So it, she's going to get married and she is, uh, she's been holding out like the Allison Eastwood, we learn has not been speaking to Earl for There's got to be a couple years. of these in Eastwood's family. Some people who don't talk to him anymore. Some people who are sort of Well, that's of like, the confusing thing is because there are so many like pictures of Dina Eastwood and Maggie Eastwood, his first wife right. and his second wife like having lunch together with Francis Fisher or something like they all they it seems like everything is is perfectly cordial I mean I hope that's the, the case clan. So if I'm gonna speculate I I hope for the best but I would also say it seems like you might also form and in fact I'm happy to see it this the sorority of just trauma like, behind well okay, yeah. yeah sister wives exactly having known the Eastwood club and all, in all his uh highs and lows Right. I guess maybe the, the man the man might not be that present, so you need someone to talk to about him. <laughs> right. Who knows? Yep. But, you know, I, I, I follow all of the Eastwood children on Instagram. They're always liking each other's Instagram posts. Mm -hmm. And recently, Scott was, he posted a picture where he's at the airport doing like a, sort of like the, the baby pose, uh, the yoga pose, uh, if you're familiar, yes, where I you're am, yeah. on your back holding your feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, Scott, who has a different mother whose mother was married to clint when clint or maybe was divorced anyway they've got different mothers and of various legality uh, he commented like ha 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 the airlines really make you assume the position don't they or something like that like <laughs> stupid just you know yeah just lads nice. chopping it up yep half brother stuff yeah that's but not, 
not not so with Earl Stone. No, no. So everybody has stopped talking to him. His ex-wife does not talk to him. His daughter does not talk to him. Uh, the sons-in-law have an interesting presence to the film where they're, they're kind of just like apologetic uh, weaklings, beta males or something. I don't know. They're basically, like in Monty Python, they're certain not appearing in this film. Right. They're just not. They're not. <laughs> but really they are there, which makes it funnier. It. But Ginny is the granddaughter. Yes. And she... Right, right, right. right was hopeful she still maintains a relationship with earl stone so when he shows up at her pre-wedding and he was supposed brunch, to cover the drinks for yes. the wedding and she is sort of like not totally forgiving but understanding of his foibles uh while when her mom and her grandma get there they say like we're not going to stay if he stays basically why well, can't stand to be around this man right it's one of us yeah and why because he was Spending all his time at his work, and then we learn later that his... Yeah, he says, I was on the road 60 hours a week to provide for this family. But then his ex-wife clarifies, well, you were on the road giving each other little trophies, like uh, buying drinks for each other, all the things that we did see him do at the beginning. Oh, another name I thought you might have was OK Fiance. That was another <laughs> name on my list. <laughs> Good. Then, you know, the this mysterious brown man appears from the wedding party now this is different Victor than the Rasuk real Rasik. story uh which i think right. is an interesting choice i think it's maybe intentionally a non-racist choice or maybe not maybe there's other concerns but yeah and well in the, in the real story it seemed unclear to me that they had pinned down who this came from yeah if it was just a story that he had he had the in the real story leo sharp had been connected to uh mexican drug trafficking organizations dtos as they call them mm -hmm. in the trade uh, through a Mexican laborer whom he worked with. Which is, of course, much closer to the stereotype which mixes classism, racism, migration, xenophobia, drug war, conservative terror, you know, that it all gets uh, into this like beautiful, hardened chain of why these people are awful. Check out Sicario Day of the Soldado, everybody. <laughs> that's, Fucking that's right. In case you, you thought the missing link in the chain was uh, Islamic terror. So, uh, yeah. Literally opens with, uh, that movie opens with like radical Islamic terrorists <laughs> crossing the U.S.-Mexico border and like s s uh, kneeling down to, to with a prayer rug like on the fucking banks of the Rio Grande yeah. or something. Yep. And then they walk into Kansas and blow up like suicide bomb of Kmart or yes. something. Yep. That's right. Fucking evil shit, uh -huh. frankly, to, to put in a film. Also fairly dull. Yes. Anyway. But I think not unreasonable to mention Sicario because obviously these are the types of films in recent history that have allowed American audiences to engage. And I would say the first Sicario, at least you and I saw it together, I believe. And we both thought it was at least morally gray in a way that was interesting concerned with uh like dea corruption and tre yes. treatment of women by law enforcement machos and while also maybe holding some questionable views about mexico uh which is sort of like the 2000s era of mexico drug film or like yeah i mean know? i watched traffic yeah in preparation for this film a, a, a film with uh extraordinarily like liberal drug politics where it at the end it's like why aren't we worrying about treating these people uh-huh exactly but like don't forget we should just carpet bomb mexico yeah. like they, they don't they don't sort of answer that nope. question don't forget that all the it's the problem is how scary these guys all are as well right exactly and benicio del toro has right of first refusal on all of these films <laughs> yeah that's correct if there's a movie about the drug war yeah benicio gets to say yay or nay yes i i did also watch a uh speaking of sicario a, a Pretty fun movie that was similar to this, directed by our, our friend Rick Roman Waugh, who's mm, become of course. Gerard yep. Butler's go-to partner, the director of Kandahar. Recently mentioned. Yeah, he uh, he made a movie in the mid-2000s with Dwayne The Rock Johnson called Snitch, where DTRJ has to, he's like a construction company owner, he's like a boss, mm -hmm. whose son gets caught up in a in a dea sting and due to mandatory minimum sentencing laws is going to have to spend like 20 years in prison for receiving a package from his friend that had a bunch of molly in it or something yeah and the only way that the son could get out of the sentence would be to rat out someone higher up than him in the organization but he doesn't know anybody because mm -hmm. he's not in the organization yep 
And of course, DA Susan Sarandon has no patience for any of this. Of course. But DTRJ is like, well, what if I, what if I capture somebody for you? <laughs> and like, this is patently absurd. But she yeah. says, okay, if you can, if you can get us a big arrest. And so he kind of goes undercover and he's a trucker. Like he owns these trucks for the, the, uh, now give me a read on the tone of this film. This is like, this is like central intelligence, Kevin Hart type of a, no, no, no this is like, Dwayne The Rock Johnson thinking maybe he's going to be a real actor, but not doing a great job. Mm. It's very, it's very much like a Gerard Butler type movie. Interesting. Okay. All right. Yeah. And as the, uh, the sort of the construction employee with a checkered past who connects him to the drug trade, we have a pre-Sicario John Bernthal. Oh, wow. Okay. The cast of this movie is real. Oh, sorry. It's 2013. It just feels like it's 2007 or something. Sure. We got DTRJ. We got Barry Pepper. We got Susan Sarandon. We got yeah. John Bernthal. We got Benjamin Bratt. We got Michael K. Williams. I mean, it's Ooh. a. There's a, a brief uh, David Harbour. Okay. Uh, Pre right. Stranger Thing. Yeah. We also got uh, Flights Nadine Velasquez is okay. in there. Uh huh. Uh huh. Just to connect. So, anyway, check out Snitch. It's a. Uh, at a red box near you, for sure. That's, that's exactly right. So this is a yeah. The drug war film is a classic recent subgenre, yeah. and they're often politically pretty nasty. They are because basically the sort of like founding principles of these films are even if they bring in a sort of noirish uh, like mire to the whole thing, which a lot of them do. You know that that's the way that they complicate things, right? You're saying like there's all these bad actors. You're like Brecken or uh, <laughs> yes. Yep. I don't think he's in any of these. To say like, you know, the the police officials are corrupt and maybe some even some people in the US are corrupt, which is part of the problem. But the underlying principle is Mexico is a scary place that loves to make drugs and we are not doing enough to stop the influx of drugs from this scary place where you can just get your head cut off just by looking at the wrong person, basically. And I think this film does some pretty remarkable things to counteract that. First of all, just speaking of the Mexico filter, the only images of Mexico that we get in this film are at the mansion of Correct. Laton, yep. the kingpin played by Andy Garcia, who seems to have struck his neck on uh, something hard right before <laughs> showing up for work. He's doing such a... He's like, the, you know, well, uh, look, I'm the drug guy. I have to address the fact that for any Spanish speakers, the film is a very interesting mix of spoken Spanish by somebody like Andy Garcia, who is extremely, not just Cuban, but Cuban American in his Spanish. But he's like, in a way that I respect, he's doing about 1% work to turn it Mexican. Uh, Weirdly, and that, there are a lot of New York actors in this film. There are. Yeah. And then you have uh, Ignacio. I don't know if he pronounces it Italian style, like uh, Argentinian right, 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 yeah. people love to do. Sericchio, probably. Um, he is doing a much better job at doing a Mexican accent, but he is also clearly just an uh, Argentinian guy, you know, doing a very good Mexican it's accent playing julio yeah and then sometimes you just have mexican actors who when they speak it's sort of like oh yeah this is like what mexican spanish sounds like forgot for a second because right. this is right. the real yeah. this is the real thing uh which is an yeah. unusual patchwork and then also andy garcia is like speaking english a lot of the time which is fine like most just, of the time it's just like right. a hunt for red october type of like who cares whatever yeah but it's interesting that the only images we get of mexico are of a beautiful mansion yeah. with a very broad yep. green lawn correct and you don't we don't see any drug use in the film nope at all which i think is a smart choice see, yeah because often these films will show you you know some some uh inner city hellhole uh, no-go exactly, zone exactly with people nodding on every corner and and typically like in traffic you get like the uh the white kids who end up there and get strung out and that's like the greatest tragedy of all yeah for for our richard jewel episode i was reading about journalistic malpractice and came across jimmy's world are you familiar with this this is like a total I'm very familiar with jimmy i took journalism one <laughs> okay. yeah i know about jimmy's world uh but that's the type of stuff we're getting in these films right. usually it's like jimmy's world like, famously fabricated yeah washington like, post story eight-year-old kid or something was like five-year-old <laughs> heroin addict <laughs> yeah so yeah. that's what we get in these movies is like this is what happens right this is where these drugs and i'm right. I'm not trying to downplay how drugs can ruin people's lives, certainly, 
but I think it becomes this extremely blunt tool that's wielded uh, to bad ends in most of these pictures. I got to tell you, while we're bringing up Jimmy's World and, and uh, <laughs> Journalism 1, mm-hmm. we also had to read a, a story by uh, Shattered Glass himself. Of course. Uh, what was his name? Stephen Glass? Yeah, yep. Right, which was ri- written and directed by uh, Richard Jewell screenwriter Billy Ray. Of course, by the way. yeah, yeah. But we had to read a story by him that was a fabricated like profile of a sort of a dot com wonderkind or something um, who had a company called Juked Micronics. Oh, this is the one that he made the website for and stuff, right? J U K T yeah. Juked Micronics, and that that's just stuck in my head for the rest of my life. I, it, you're correct to say that Juked Micronics is incredible. I believe this is like maybe the story that triggered his exposure because people tried to find it. I believe so. And there was a Palo Alto number that they called and it was like so clearly his brother, or his friend or something pretending <laughs> to be like, hey, CEO of Juked Micronics here. Uh, what can I do for you? Uh. Man, it used to be so easy to get away with stuff. <laughs> that was true. like Stephen Glass. He was born like a year yeah. too late to get away with that. <laughs> Scott free exactly right yeah um anyway Anyway, so drug drug films i think one of the ways that this uh i'm gonna say now just the word juked is in my head it it jukes away from these problems (laughs) is that um first of all the guy getting involved is a elderly white man the reasons that he's getting involved with the drug trade are extremely clear and they're they're made the focus of the film like a long time before drugs even get into the the issue right and it's sort of a mix a mix of like you know he is made probably not homeless homeless but he lost his house he can't support his uh, granddaughter and her wedding and we find out later that a lot of the like social institutions of the town are failing right so we can think of that as maybe right. part of this is like you know he's not getting support from from other places uh and i think this is great and it's also great that it this is all happening to a white guy not to like a a mexican kid stereotype right and a white guy in peoria yeah. not even in el paso exactly yeah. exactly so i think this is this is you know treating the issue separately because of course that is why most people in mexico also get involved with the drug trade right it's not out of some sort of cartoonish interest in shooting people or trafficking humans or something. Right, exactly. It's like, you know, why would you get mad at somebody in San Francisco for working for a tech company? It's Correct. like that's the Yep. That's th- where the jobs are. That's or like the industry. Coal mining. It's bad for you and bad exactly. for the town and bad for the environment, but you do it because that is what's available to you. Well, it's the same thing with the tech industry, to be clear. Yes. Yep. Bad for you, bad for the town, bad for the environment. Correct. Yeah, I was I was really blown away when I because this I had not watched the film prior to watching it for this podcast and blown away by how how much it contextualizes not only Earl's, you know, he shouldn't be working at this age. He shouldn't have to. And how much it centralizes Earl's difficulty in making a living and also the total abandonment of social institutions around him like the VFW, like the family frankly mm-hmm. yep like the the ice rink somebody mentions the ice uh-huh. rink which that's literally in in ben affleck's the town yeah it uh, is great I, ben affleck's uh-huh. character literally has has like anonymously paid to fix the ice rink mm-hmm. with the proceeds from a, a bank heist you you also get like foregrounded is the the evil of these institutions like the bank that is foreclosing on his farm, like the insurance company that won't shell out for the VFW mm-hmm. hall. Yep. Even the the DEA agents, which we haven't gotten to, but the DEA agents are all focused on career. Like they're all talking about uh, how to you know make make big cases so you can get the fuck out of Chicago. Like nobody wants to be where they are. Everyone is is very distinctly in this late capital moment that we're all in like trying to fuck over as many people as you can to just get out of the shitty situation you're in now because ideally there's a less shitty one somewhere else and you know it's like a sort of a moving target yeah i want to shout out friend of the show glenn who on his letterbox review highlights just this like little slice of life discussion between michael pena and bradley cooper 
where Michael Pena mentions having five kids and Bradley Cooper yeah, yeah. Show, like does a double take and says like, well, how do you make that work with this job? Five. I think both like yeah. hours wise and probably, you know, they probably make like whatever, $40,000 a year or something. Right. Um, so I don't know. I see listings for the FBI and stuff on LinkedIn a lot and they're, they're, they pay pretty they? well. Okay. All right. Well then they shouldn't be. I mean, they pay like a uh, hundred grand a year, which okay. is not enough to support a family of five but is more than forty thousand dollars well that's i mean more than the vast majority of people supporting families of five probably make in the country like, oh well, yeah but i make. but it's yeah. i'm just still fucking yeah brutal it's not like a full-on discussion of you know how these institutions have failed or what the problem is but this is what we don't get in most discussions of of like you know mexico fo- focused drug war films if you were getting people talking about like NAFTA and its influence on, you know, the mm-hmm. rise of the, of the drug trade in the 90s. If you had people talking about historical lack of capitalist interest in, in industrializing nations where you get like raw materials and raw labor, uh, which is always fascinating because it's this yep. like snake eating its tail of capitalist countries don't want to invest in these countries uh, in terms of like manufacturing goods and adding value to goods because there's no market there, right? It's because they don't have enough money to buy the manufactured goods. But the reason yep. they don't have enough money is because they don't have a like, manufacturing level of yep. capitalist yep. production. So look, it's, I'm not saying it's reaching that level, but I think by focusing on the US and by focusing on things that people are familiar a little bit more with the historical context, right? Of like the, the you know loss of manufacturing jobs and the middle class in the United States is implicit in this film it means that everybody is like i think on a better page in terms of oh this is why this happens this isn't just this one guy in a like republican failure to pull yourself up at your bootstraps narrative right this is a guy who worked and it yeah the system failed him still the system failed him as it failed all of us right and you know what's what's interesting to, to get back to the to sort of tie it back to the the how this film is different from other uh, drug war films, we also get quickly we get what is very recognizable as like a pleasant workplace family essentially oh, yeah. at the tire yes. shop. Yep. With these guys, first of all, I love all of these guys. Yep. I love Robert Lasardo okay. as Emilio. Mm-hmm. This is the guy with the shaved head and the sort of long beard yes um this guy fucking speaking of of working this guy made like what, some like 20 movies last year or something yeah, this guy just, hell yeah just works he's so winning in like a single line of dialogue right he can be scary and then and then uh, adjust it to to charming mm-hmm. like uh immediately he's also he was like a like an abel ferrara guy he's in china girl and and king of new york he's in a couple of like steven seagal movies he's in leon the professional he's in Waterworld, and then now he is in uh just fucking everything yep um you've also got saul hueso who plays he plays andres who is the guy who ends up helping uh earl with how to use the phone in a very funny scene it's so cute it's very cute and i also want to shout out this is something that's come up a lot on on the podcast uh, in my research but i haven't talked about it all of these actors is sort of aspiring actors who get like a background role and in many clint movies he is just casting i think people whose faces and tapes he likes yep. and so you have people who don't do a lot of big stuff except for a clint movie and then right. they go back to like streaming shows you've never heard of um so many of these guys will and women as well. They they will take a picture with like the A list star of the project they're in, just like truly a selfie. But yeah. then they'll post it to their own IMDb yes, you page. Yes, this with me. Really nice. So I've got one also of Saul Hueso with Alfred Molina. Oh yeah, and great. One of him with Maria Bello because he was on the NBC version of Prime Suspect. Uh huh. Yep. And I don't know. It's just cute, especially when the guy is playing in the in the first scene. He's at least playing like scary. A uh, tough guy. Well, they're to all playing him. on our on our expectations, which I yes. think is great, right? Saying like, yeah, right. these, these must be monsters. These these drug trade guys, right? And then they, but they still call him Viejito like immediately. They're sort of confused by what his deal is, uh-huh. but yeah, they they by the end of the film, we we like these guys. These are like nice guys. They're acting, you know. He's asking like, "How's your nephew?" And there's a real sense of this as a as a job. Yeah, it's exactly because um, it's it's not like it's pure over the top like you know they're revealed to be uh cartoonishly nice they're just 
uh, normally friendly and engaging with him in the, in the same kind of like recycled workplace jokes that you would use every time you saw the guy from legal or whatever. Right. Exactly. And later we also get Earl trying to protect Salueso's character because he's not revealing who gave him the address of the actual drop. Right. Yeah. Which yeah, I think yeah. Is nice. You know, he's just kind of like looking out for this guy he knows, which is a contrast to the implied evil of being a of somebody spreading cocaine across the midwest yeah we also got noel g as bald rob yep. noel g oh, you've probably yeah. seen in Everybody a million things this, yeah. he's in training day he's in he's in the fast and the furious and uh furious seven as well old school he's in masked and anonymous with bob dylan uh, he's in SWAT. He's in mm -hmm. Crank. He's yep. in you know. He, he's basically anywhere that there is a the Chicano gangster character. Noel G is probably just around the corner. Just a, uh -huh. a great face, great presence. Love this man. Yes, one of those guys who's like, when is he bad? Uh huh. Truly. No, really. And we also have so after after Earl makes the first run successfully, and he starts to get sort of respected by the the higher ups we get julio who uh is played as you mentioned by ignacio uh, sericchio who gets like a full scary to friendly arc Correct. as well well he not only just says scary to friendly but also asshole to friendly like like i mean yeah. this is also like the the mean boss learning to be human again as a separate yeah. story or like a parallel story to the drug trade to normal guy thing right there's like two there's sort of two things going on in this film of interest to this podcast in my mind there's mm -hmm. clint once again engaging with his own inadequacies or deficiencies as a father yep and, and a partner as well yeah and a partner and also a film about employee employer relationships uh -huh. like a, yeah. a film about the workplace yep because Ultimately, what happens is, and we're, you know, we've, I think, just abandoned going in order with the plot. Yeah, it's, it's vague. Yeah. Who cares? What happens is you get, Andy Garcia is sort of a lenient, old style, uh -huh. let's yes. say, I don't know, Robert Evans type. Yeah. Fast and loose with the rules, you know, results. Anti-technocratic, sort of like. Anti-technocratic. Extravagant. If it gets done, everybody's going to do it their style, you know, as long as yeah. I, I get the results I'm looking for, I'm not going to complain. The way people used to, the way people uh, describe Las Vegas as running under the mob, uh -huh. where like, yep. just because this singer didn't make the most money of anybody who'd ever performed in the casino, like if the boss liked him, it's fine. We'll keep him in there for 20 years. Yeah, more. exactly. So he gets taken out by Clifton Collins Jr. Yes. Who then institutes... A like neoliberal reform agenda. Exactly, yeah. exactly. An MBA style yeah. efficiency above all else. I think this is called the Taylor system. Sometimes this is like employed in in uh, Latin American factories that all the factory owners learn from America. They would go learn this and say like, okay, you should like use the type of light bulbs that you know create the most efficiency. Basically, everything that is focused on results above human treatment. And what's fascinating about the movie is that this is exactly what gets Earl caught. This is what brings them yeah. down is yep. because he's not allowed to make his weird stops anymore and do his strange old man stuff. Visit his friend all of a sudden. I think this is nice. And I just want to add very briefly, I can imagine maybe this is straw man stuff, but I can imagine a critic who thought this was too unbelievable to be interesting. When in fact, I think if you dig at all in the story, this is very much what Leo Sharp was like. He was like this kind of, you know, guy who would stop at the Waffle House and didn't quite know right. how to be afraid of the right people he was supposed to be afraid at, of. At one point, he was being pursued by, he was being like followed by the DEA and he went through a drive through. <laughs> yeah. And it's because the DEA, which is running exactly the same sort of Taylor system style, highly efficient. Mm hmm. Uh, and as we see in the film, like uh, budgetarily strapped operation. And shout out to Lawrence Fishburne, who's back from Mystic River. Good to see Larry again, as always. Yep. Oh yeah. He's he's right in his his uh, groove here. Uh, he's. I mean, he is. He as doesn't need any his setup. behind the desk yep. era. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. They're able to catch him once he gets more efficient because that's easier to track right. rather than being a human being. 
one of my big brain reads, and this is actually where my big brain read also transcends the boundaries of time and space. Okay. Clint has has a few years early made a film about David Zasloff. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. This is a movie about the takeover of Warner Brothers by the demon David Zasloff. Yep, of course. Who famously in a meeting that was, I don't know, leaked to the press or something, said, uh, we don't owe Clint Eastwood anything. Like, yeah. why are we giving this man money to make movies? He specifically was talking about Cry Macho. And I don't think this is like accidental prophecy. I'm sure that Clint had come up against many oh, David yeah, yeah. Zaslav types. Of course. David Zaslav. The, yes, the, the precisely. The transition in Hollywood from the sort of half showman, half shyster kind of old movie industry heads like your Robert Evans, who was an actor, or like Lou Wasserman, or like yeah. any of these other guys. Uncle Lemley uh, or whatever. Like the, the Warners, Carl Lemley. Uh, I think Lou Wasserman might have been late. Just scratch that. I'm editing this one. Okay. So like like the Warner Brothers, like all these guys who were like half gangster, frankly, yeah. the transition from them who they would take a flyer on a weird idea. They would give somebody a, a relatively riskless amount of money to make a weird movie. And sometimes it popped. I mean, this is sort of the the Blumhouse model, which is one of the more successful and smarter things anyone's done in Hollywood Correct. in decades. Yep. The transition from that to especially in the 80s with like corporatization of the studios and takeovers and, and purchases of all the the film studios by like the Coca-Cola company and and uh, whatever kind of like juked Micronics type type <laughs> multinational. And then they're just being run by MBAs who are treating movies exactly the same way they would the manufacturer paper clips. Yes. Assuming that that's how the alchemy between yes. however many hundreds of artists who are collaborating on a single piece right with the strangeness of a moment in history and whatever's going on with audiences somehow all those things can be turned like in economics you can freeze a bunch of variables artificially and then pretend yeah, you know what's yeah, going to yeah. happen right and so clint has been making movies through all of this yep. and has seen this pattern happen has largely been immune to it because he's had a, enough success i mean this exact year he's made basically this in 1517 to paris cost roughly the same amount of money between 30 and 50 million dollars mm -hmm. 1517 doesn't really make any money or doesn't make enough yeah it's a, and then this okay. one makes back like five times its budget yep and so that's essentially both films making two and a half times their budget who is mad somehow right. david zaslov yep the man who sees films as as literally like potential tax write-offs. Yes, yes. And so this is what the Clifton Collins Jr. character is doing. He is exact. He's he's putting the rules into place. And this is when, of course, we see Julio start to soften, right? Because he's maybe been won right. over by by Tata at this point. I love this Julio guy. Yeah, uh, this this actor is great. Yep. He's I agree. He does very a good handsome. Job. He's mm -hmm. he's sure winning. Is. They have that conversation where. Earl tells him to leave the thing, leave the industry. Uh huh. And and he says, well, you know, Laton gave me everything I have. Um, and he said, well, it's okay, yeah, but I, I think it's do something else. This is why know? I gotta give Nick Shank some credit because there's a couple moments in the film where instead of pursuing something into uh, like excessive textual discussion, right, they just sort of like let it trail off, which is, I think, closer to human reality and also just much more interesting and engaging an audience and in, in thinking about something, right? Instead of basically like putting a hammy expository finish to any discussion you're having, they'll, like you said, he just says like, okay, well, like I, you know, the implication is like, I can't make you do this. You have lived your experience and I'm just trying right. to share my experience with you, yeah. which indicates to me that you'd be better off somewhere else. And at the same time, Julio says, like, I'm somebody here, yeah. which yep. which points to the facility of, like, the drug trade for people in, you know, uh, shitty economic situations like those in Mexico and those in the United States. I was and, and we also understand that to be the reasoning behind why Earl Stone was the way he was, right? Because yeah. later he says something very similar and, like, I, I chose... To spend so much of my energy and time out because I thought I was somebody out there and that turns out to have been a mistake. Yep. We got two scenes we got to talk about. Yep. Specifically. All right. First, tire change scene. 
Yes, it's true. Um, we promised. Actually, first dice on bike scene. Oh yeah. Uh huh. No notes. No notes. Yeah. Perfect scene. See, Moving look, on. That felt like upgraded Shank. Like he right. had, he had refined it. This is what he was looking for. This is one. Well, it's it's interesting because the lesbian biker group has uh, reclaimed a term used as a slur. Correct. As yeah. many in the in the in many lesbian communities have done this, mm-hmm. and then to hear Earl use it right back to them as if it's fine to say is surprising to them. But there's no resolution to the scene. No. And we're all left to sort of think, huh? I mean, I guess. N- no harm done, but it is weird to hear this. Yeah, and they're initially defensive because of their lived experience. They're just used to being, right. you know, like uh, treated as masculine and, uh, you know, having their sexuality confused for their gender and vice versa and stuff. Um, and he just makes a turn and says like, oh, whatever, basically, that's fine. I don't care about that. I'm just telling you that it's your repeater. Or something. Making sure that they solve the problem with their motorcycle. Yep. And very similarly, we have the tire change scene. Yes. Now, I didn't talk about this on Richard Jewell. I recently changed my first tire. You did. Applause. Yeah, that's true. Applause for uh-huh. Jay. I pulled either my peck or my <laughs> lat or both. I My serratus anterior. I Your generation to have loves to pull their injured. serratus anterior. Yeah. Wildly. Yeah. yeah. I I did what... Now... You Googled it. Specifically, this is the, the character in the film is... The actor's name is Kareem J. Grimes, mm-hmm. and he is simply credited as Nerdy Husband, which is very interesting <laughs> yep. that that's what it said in the script. But there's a black couple who I think have a Prius, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, and they're in the desert. This is when Julio and Julio's number two, who gets killed, they are following Earl, and this is sort of the example of, of his unusual manner of yes. conducting himself as a drug mule. He pulls over to help this couple, black couple in the desert. The male, the the nerdy husband is uh, holding up his phone, trying to get service because he's trying to look up how to change a tire Mm -hmm. and can't get reception to go to YouTube. And Earl says specifically, that's the trouble with this generation. You can't open a fruit box without (laughs) calling the Internet. Which I love. That is something an old man would say. Special edition third question okay what is a fruit box yeah hell yeah great question is he talking about the little like jewel case that like strawberries come in i think is he talking about i think he's talking about when you order like a big box of oranges from somewhere like nice oranges like a harry and david yes like that's uh, yeah the very company i was thinking of Mm -hmm. he's not talking about like a wooden crate of bananas from honestly who knows doesn't matter this is the kind of mysterious use of language we can expect from people of a different generation who maybe are starting to have dementia so he says oh you know you you don't know how to do anything without looking it up and he starts to help them and says something like isn't this great helping you young negro folks out this is the word he uses helping negroes out or something yes yep and then trevina springer as young wife Uh uh-huh that's her character says excuse me and they're taken aback by the well, use they, of this they share language look first which is part of the humanization i'm talking about because yeah. they're given not just an exchange with him they're given like an exchange with right. each other where yes. it's sort of like their faces are like what do we think is his intention here like how should we deal with this which i think is great it's a very and, complex look and what they then say is like sir we don't use that word anymore mm-hmm. uh, you can call us black people or just people uh-huh and he says Okay, and then kind of stumbles over the next line in a very Clint one take fashion, and says like, "Well, let's get to it. Let's let's start jacking the car up or yep. whatever." Yep. And um, much was made in reviews at the time of the fact that this couple is black, like that the couple who can't change the tire are also black, which I oh. find fairly irrelevant. So do I. They are driving a Prius. I thought it was much closer. If it's doing any type of stereotyping, it's the like coastal elite. Right. They're called young wife and nerdy husband. They're supposed to be like millennials. That's yeah, all. Exactly. It is. But then they've they've included like I wonder even if there were two different scenes and they combined mm, maybe maybe the dialogue with this one. But it it does really speak to something. And this is something that I get tripped up with. One of the prejudices that I have trouble letting go of is the notion that uh especially like older white people with backwards ideas are beyond help and mm. should be just left out of the question of pushing toward a a 
better world. And I think this scenes in particular, along with the the scene of the the biker lesbians and even the the sort of taco wagon joke at the beginning of the film, are are indications that like just because an old white person is not has not kept up with all the ways that you're, we're supposed to talk to each other now to to minimize re-traumatizing folks who have experienced systemic racism and sexism and, and all the rest. Just because someone doesn't know the latest words doesn't mean that we should jump all over them and, and then walk away. I guess this is sort of the calling in Correct. approach. I was basically broken like a stallion about this. If you ever do any actual organizing with people and not just internet activism or like writing about these issues and i'm not saying are, are non-contributions are also important i just think they give you a skewed perspective versus trying to actually work with populations of people and you immediately yep. realize all the people you are working with maybe or the the majority of them hold some type of prejudice that you as a uh, hyper educated very like theory literate person know to be bad and guess what they're also the people that you are supposedly respecting and understanding to be human and trying to help them get into a better position in the world. Right. So you basically have to reckon immediately either you think any person who holds a view like this or says something like this uh, should be abandoned, in which case you're abandoning your principles in that sense, or you immediately have to understand like, okay, well, my job is just to try to help them on the main issues I'm concerned with and maybe also nudge them towards like you're saying call them in about maybe some things that they're not aware that they're doing because most of these people right. you know that they, they've, they've held these views because in my case first they grew up in like working class san francisco and the things people said about asian workers weren't that great but maybe they're also very uh interested in their their cantonese co-workers families and they see them as human beings they just don't quite have all the the tools to to you can you can somehow it's it's surprising how easy it is for people to somehow be racist toward chinese people but also really love john from right, exactly accounting yep you know this is the you know the the not insignificant not at all insignificant number of of bernie to trump voters yeah this is you know there there are i was just listening to a, another podcast an episode of another podcast where a guy was talking about a book he had written about the deep state in a in a like a non-paranoid sense uh -huh, in the sense sure. of entrenched industrial and and military interests that have yeah. persisted throughout the last you know century of american history and then at the end it was fascinating and i was very interested and then at the end of it he says and that's why you know in 2024 i'm throwing my weight behind rfk jr uh -huh. And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, you are." Yeah. Granted, this episode was this podcast episode was recorded like a, many, many months ago. A few so, like I'll, insane I'll you, things I that the guy you said ago for years, but months still this pretty late. Recorded when he was a child. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it was it's crazy, but still like this is. I mean, organizing is all about, and you you know this much more firsthand than I do. But it's it is all about finding common ground and and worrying about the uncommon ground later. Yep. Essentially, I mean, there there are, as they say on citations needed all the time. There are you know a. a small number of incorrigible racist uh, monsters who we'll never get to, but many more people than you think can be brought around, brought around to seeing the world the way that we do if, if we treat them with dignity and talk to them like adults. Exactly. And it's neither, it's neither a case of like postponing it indefinitely, right? I'm not saying this is not an issue, especially when you're working with a broad coalition and you want to make sure everybody's respecting each other, right? That's, it can be a little bit urgent in that sense and making sure that like somebody is not going to use trans exclusive language or whatever uh, because you also want trans people to be comfortable in that exact environment same environment but it is like you're saying also not about condescending to them and saying like you know oh sweetie you don't know about this stuff because they have lived in their minds a very rich life a, a life of of learning and all the the ideas that they have about the world are based on something that they believe to be true so it's right. about respectful engagement with those experiences and showing why they maybe have misled them somehow or could be combined with other new knowledge and honestly you know selfishly somewhat embarrassing to to mention but this is like one of the most useful things about being a 
cishet white dude Correct. on yeah. the left. Yes. It's like I can I can talk to uh, racist white people without well, without feeling like your safety is in question. My safety is less in question, but yeah. also like I can just withstand the yeah. microaggressions the for longer uh-huh. because I have I've had to deal with fewer of them. Yeah, and they're not targeted at you directly. Oftentimes, so I think yeah. it's easier. Yes, I think that is one of the better jobs that that people can do from that position. And I'm also, you know, like ambiguously Semitic. <laughs> That's true. Yes. It could go either way. Uh-huh. There's some Irish in there, clearly. We've also got the scene of the the Chicano driver who is pulled over. That's true. That I wanted to yes, talk about. We sure do. Yeah. So there there the DEA is we also, you know, Michael Pena, we haven't even mentioned, but shout out to Michael Pena. Oh yeah. Who is Love to see him. very funny. Yep. A, a good actor. Agree with his religious beliefs entirely uh-huh. as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. You uh, he's the, a Scientologist. Yes, he is. Big, big blue um, building is real attractive to you. Well, look, the the blue is innocent. The blue is very nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I work like yeah. a mile from Big Blue. Mm-hmm. I can see it when I take a walk at lunch. But Michael Payne, he also, like, he kind of reminds me sometimes of his very silly uh, mall security guard character from Observe and Report <laughs> okay. uh-huh. in certain scenes in this film. Yeah. Anyway. Shout out Michael Pena. So they, they're sweeping uh, the roads trying to find... They, they know that Tata is in a black pickup truck. Mm-hmm. And so they pull over a guy who looks to be of, of Latin American heritage in a straw cowboy hat. And he immediately starts doing all the things that seem totally reasonable for a brown person to do when they're pulled over by law enforcement. And he says, I'm stepping out of the vehicle. He's like declaring all of the things he's doing yes. very clearly, yep. moving de- very deliberately, saying, I'm not a threat. I don't have any weapons, no drugs, don't have any drugs, never had any drugs, don't use drugs, not uh-huh. high. Yep. And starts saying, you know, sort of compulsively. Statistically, this is, this is the most dangerous five minutes of my life. Yes. And it's very effective how much of a different, like, tone of reality he is in compared to the other characters in the film who are to this point the film has not given us any indication that they have any like racial no motivation animosity for the, or yeah, yeah yeah which obviously we know that they would as as correct law enforcement yep. agents but in the film they haven't said any of this like uh-huh. they don't seem to have any any problems with this at all but i, I do think it's an effective it's a very effective demonstration of how much that doesn't matter to a brown person getting pulled over even to to someone who would say well not all cops are yes. racist yeah well, like, how do you, you know you can't at all right. expect yeah especially when they pull them over in a an ambulance like oh. the whole thing is bizarre because <laughs> exactly. they're in unmarked cars yeah but then it all ends up fine and the DEA guys cuz he's not involved the DEA guys get back in their cars and he changes tone entirely and says like thank you officers have a good day Mm -hmm. and like can't get his seatbelt out Uh of the yeah socket because he's like pulling it too hard and i wonder what you make of this scene because it it could be kind of easy to read this as parody of mocking him yes yeah i could not figure it out because the the, for example like on paper the seatbelt thing is good writing to me because that is like something you do you know like when you're so borderline traumatized or like you know or frazzled yeah. with something you get pulled over and you realize you've been driving around with in, in absolute silence for an hour exactly. after you get pulled exactly. over yeah, yeah yes yeah. yes perfect way to put it uh and also the number of times that he says like statistically this is the five the most dangerous minutes of my life borders right. on again this like repetition to the point of making him look like a fool but yeah i agree with you that in some senses, it's very well done because we have been following the DEA and it seems so odd, right? Because they can't even like grapple with the idea that this man is so afraid, right? Because b- basically, yeah, they yeah. initially think he is the target. And then as soon as they decide he's not the target, they don't care about him at all, which is basically cops relationship to you, right? They see you as a threat or they don't give a shit about you. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It seemed like maybe there was like conflicting understandings on set of this scene that's how uh yeah. unclear it is to me my conclusion would be that it's sort of a american sniper style cipher where it is uh, designed for the audience to bring their own assumptions mm. to yep. and to maybe confirm them for anyone yeah um and in that case it is a very effectively 
uh, hard to pin down scene. I right. mean, they did that well. Yep. Then uh, Earl is being tailed now by some new guys who are much tougher about the rules. We have Daniel Moncada as Eduardo, who our 15-year-old listeners will recognize us uh, from Breaking Bad. Yep. In my mind, the only people who watch Breaking Bad are 15. Uh-huh. No offense, it's anyone who... And it better call Saul, he's also in. Yeah, I think this, those shows are fine. I think it's the fandom around them that it's uh, yeah. more poisonous. And maybe... Uh, another huge part of the, the drug war culture Correct. of the last... Uh, yes. Or pop culture of the last 10 yep. years. Uh, 15, whatever. But... Uh, and this guy took a very funny selfie with Clint. Um he did. That he posted to his own IMDb where Clint yeah. doesn't seem to know that the photo's being taken. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, but anyway, so he is a scary guy with a scary beard who um, seems like he's never going going to warm to no. uh, Earl. And even then, after the funeral scene, on the phone privately, yes. he says, like, his fucking wife, his, his fucking esposa, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, Which died. And I so, think he's, you know... We get so many layers of types of people, right? How, to what degree they've retained their, their compassion for other people. Uh, it's just such a nice spread, right? None of them, none of them are exactly yeah. like the others. It doesn't like, it doesn't seem like this guy has suddenly become good to us, right? He just, he had also has a limit, which I think I will tell you is also something that can feel surprising to people when they engage with humans who have done maybe violent or morally questionable crimes, right? There's sort of this assumption that like you must be a bad type of person when in fact that yeah. is not really the case. They have sort of permitted themselves with some amount of justification or lack of understanding or whatever to do certain things and then other things will totally be still morally reprehensible to them, wouldn't consider doing them, right? Seem, seem bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, and this is something we've talked about countless times on this show going back to uh escape from escape alcatraz, from alcatraz yep. and even like back to uh the enforcer or something mm. talking about stockholm syndrome like uh you know it, somehow extenuating circumstances apply to white people yes. and not to yep uh any other type of person who is caught doing uh breaking the law um didn't even want to say doing crime but uh -huh. breaking the law You're right. specifically. Better. that's a better frame i prefer that thank you we have skipped two parts of this. Uh, I don't know if you want if either of these are the ones you want to talk about. The Bradley Cooper Clint Eastwood conversation in the Waffle the diner House, scene? yeah, yeah. and then also the Waffle House scene. his his wife's death. Yeah, have you been to Waffle House? I I don't think I have ever been to Waffle House. I'm I have not been to Waffle House either. It is sort of mythical to me, and I don't Bourdain actually want to and experience it. Doughboys, Bourdain and, and Twitter, and, yeah, that, that, and the that uh, Waffle House like employee in the fight, throwing the, the chair, catching video, the chair. The woman, yeah, the woman who somehow like <laughs> stops the chair in there with Incredible. the force. Yeah, Incredible. Yeah, uh, they go to he, they go to Waffle House. This is after. Um, uh, Bradley Cooper takes down the the big scary guy who has like yep. a little bit of meth on him. First of all, I also wanted to say shout out to Bradley Cooper's filler and hair plugs in this movie. I mean, that's interesting that you say that. I think for the fact that it came out the same year as Star is Born, he had a, um, and I say this only because he's a man who I think can be handsome, real glow down for me. And I, and it do glow down. This is the type of, of Bradley Cooper. I mean, he looks like a cop. But this is not the. I look don't know that he if he go got with. filler to look like an alcoholic. Uh huh. To look waterlogged for yeah. *Stars Born*. If yeah. he did, smart, I guess. If he wanted to use that as an excuse to get filler because he's vain. Yeah. Fine. The hair plugs thing, I only say because when you look at him, his the hair on the very top of his head sticks so straight up yeah. and has yep. seems to have no relationship to the hair on the sides of his head. Uh huh. That. The only explanation I can come up with is is that the man took a took a flight to Istanbul. Yep. But I don't the old know. Turkey trip. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, he looks bad. But um, they have a scene at the Waffle House next to the motel, the Abe, the Honest Abe Motel. Mm -hmm. Another name I thought you might take was sure. Abe Motel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where he says shit. I forgot an anniversary and they have this conversation, which Bradley Cooper is very excited to talk about in the sort of uh, promotional material for the film, because in American Sniper, of course, he was directed by Clint, but did not get to act uh -huh. with Clint. Yeah. 
Um, but he says, I forgot the anniversary, and they have this whole conversation about how, you know, work should come second to family. You should always prioritize your family. Don't don't neglect that aspect of your life. Um, and it, you know, many critics pointed out that this reads like Clint anointing a new director. Uh, Cooper points out that when he directed Star is Born, he was 43, and when Clint made Play Misty for me, he was mm, 41. Sure, yeah. How dare he? Um, I say to that. And then, of course, the superior heir apparent to Clint Eastwood, Ben Affleck, oh, will yes. immediately reject any comparison, which yeah. is how you know he is the, the real, superior. The, the true son. Yes, exactly. This scene is good, I think. It is, yeah. to me, one of two scenes that address themes directly not usually my favorite things to do but i think are indicative of how clint can do this well right he doesn't have to always do subtext sometimes he can do right dialogue that is addressing what what he wants the audience to be thinking about so this scene we're going to escape from alcatraz <laughs> exactly this scene and the scene with his daughter when she is trying to forgive him and calls him a late bloomer and he seemingly does not accept mm -hmm. this assessment he just stays silent so I think both of them are really nice talking about things that we've been talking about this entire podcast. I'm happy we get to touch on them again. You know, yeah. Clint is aware of his issues. He is trying to now be like a specter for other people and warn them about the mistakes that it's maybe too late for him to fix. Right. He's the, the ghost of relationships past. Exactly. And I think that's yeah. that's nice in some ways. I, I almost prefer it now, uh, fingers crossed, not too close to the end of his life. But like the version when we saw it in Absolute Power... I think the implied question is sort of like, well, why don't you just right. get better at this, <laughs> right? Like you're, you're pretty young, right. you have time. But now... We, we talked about it then. Yeah, we've, uh, he seems to... Uh, so many of these films seem at first like acknowledgement of his failings and then apologies for them or, or justifications for, you know, the fact that he was, an, he was actually even better as a absent father than exactly. he was than exactly. any, any present father would be and now at the end of his life or closer to it feels much better to say like well it is too late for him to fix it it's you know or maybe he did fix it i don't know again i i don't mean to, to assume that i know what's happening in his personal life but it's a nicer artistic touch i think to say like look it feels bad to be at the end of your life knowing that you can't undo these mistakes despite how aware of them yeah. you are so right. he's trying to warn Bradley Cooper, like, you know, cut it off at, yeah. at the pass, basically. A couple of things. So Diane Weiss's character, we first yeah. get an inkling of this in the cosmetology graduation uh -huh. scene. I really appreciate, and this touches on something that Will Sloan talks, we talked about Will Sloan talking about in some of his letterbox reviews yep. on our 1517 episode. This movie does not look down at all on cosmetology no. school. This is nope. not a joke. Not a, not a punchline. And they line. even say... Like, Diane Weiss even says, I'm so glad she was able to finish school. Yeah. Like, she just calls it school. Yes. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So, Tysa Farmiga's character has graduated from cosmetology school with the help of money from Earl, who has become a, a Robin Hood, uh -huh. essentially. Yeah. Uh, but he's not even stealing money. He's earning it, uh, at least above board, as far as the cartel is concerned. Which I think this may have maybe been an artistic invention. I, there was no mention of this type of... Uh, philanthropic behavior in the article but who knows i no it doesn't but it, i think it's but, it nights in the context of the film right because this you know it's it's in as part of the, the larger the film's larger understanding of the economy as as no longer having any means of support for like anyone but billionaires it's, or outside of people who are willing to engage in immoral behavior yeah yeah and she has a little like pain and says yep. oh it comes and goes of course terrifying to me i'm sure terrifying to you as someone who sometimes has a pain that comes and goes uh -huh. but it turns out as we get in a, a pretty pretty overacted scene uh from tysa farmiga she's in the hospital she's very sick she's being sent uh home yeah. not because she's better but because there's nothing Just they can beyond, do she should beyond have... help yes we don't even really get an indication that she didn't go to the, the doctor a year ago because of it would be too expensive, but I mean it's easy to draw that conclusion. Yeah, that, that she was didn't my go because that was of, my assumption. That's why. Yeah, I think we all like to moralize about people not going to the doctor early enough, but it's such a different conversation if you're saying like somebody in the UK decided not to go to the doctor versus right. 
anybody in the U.S. who didn't go to the doctor. And even if enough. you have, even if you have like pretty good insurance, the Protestant work ethic is so yeah f- deeply ingrained in us in the U.S. that the notion of like taking care of yourself is is frowned upon, even if you can correct pay for it. So now she has like lung cancer, emphysema, or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, and this is the flip side of well-treated discussions of being a bad partner or a bad father to me because not only is uh diane weist put in a position where she is also overacting quite a bit to my mind and she's some uh, never takes her glasses off on her uh, deathbed uh-huh. which i, I found mean, interesting even when actor, she's asleep an actor i have enjoyed in many many things as a child i loved the 10th yeah. kingdom very much um what the fuck is that? Okay, well, look it up on your own time. Free time. Wonderful in Synecdoche, New York. Ian, yes. I understand you've been watching a lot of her collaborations with Woody Allen recently. Incorrect. Uh, but I did... In, there was a time in my life where I enjoyed her collaborations of with course. Woody Allen. Of course. Uh, 2022. Now, the scene we have here, the, the end of her life, allows Clint to play out a fantasy, a wish fulfillment fantasy of exactly the type you're talking about with Laura Linney and and absolute power, but to me even worse because she is saying like, basically it was all worth it even in the bad times because you were the love of my life and you are the the pain of my life. Uh Uh-huh. And you are the person I want here the most. Yeah. Again, it's trying to like add nuance by saying the pain of my life, but to me it it falls so short of saving the scene. We do have even a, a sort of uh, recapitulation, a, a, a do over of, the worst part of Trouble with the Curve, where they sort of speak the lyrics of a song aloud to one another. Yes. But it is yeah. the... Yeah, the, I love you more today than I did yesterday, but not yeah, as much as tomorrow. Then, uh, yeah, yeah, not yeah. as much tomorrow. Um, my girlfriend, by the way, pointed out that this is the, the, the resonance with the You Are My Sunshine scene. She also said that it was very funny when Julio says to... Earl, I'm not your Miho. And my girlfriend just said, I'm not your my son. <laughs> uh, which is very funny. good. Yep. Yep. It's just very funny. Not only should she have her own podcast, she should have this podcast. Yeah. And she should end it. Yep. But we get not a f- full forgiveness of himself. There is a sense that, you know, even if you fucked up, you shouldn't give up. Oh, I agree like with it's that. Still, yes. And I believe still time. in and also, rehabilitation also and making amends, all course. things that I support immensely something very strange about this film okay is that basically immediately prior to its release like days prior to its release radar online broke the news that sandra Locke had died ah uh, of course finding her in and like she the had death died, roles uh-huh. she had died six weeks prior yep and it had not been announced at all and it was only sort of discovered in a sense by the press when somebody yeah like looked at the government lists of deceased people yeah government list of people who have died yep <laughs> essentially um gordon anderson her longtime partner and legal husband received uh you know an inheritance of like 20 million dollars from her mm-hmm. and her ashes nobody could be reached for comment nobody wanted to talk about it the wikipedia the the Unusual folks who pop up whenever anyone mentions the name Sandra Locke. Correct, yeah. Have a whole list of famous co-stars who did not acknowledge her death. Um, She was left out of the Academy Awards in memoriam section. Very bizarre. But it's easy to read. Specifically, the, the only, like, it would seem total failure to the point of of not speaking to one another Mm -hmm. relationship in clint's life was with sandra Locke, uh including multiple lawsuits yes um, yeah names dragged through the mud uh really ugly stuff and they seemed not to have ever reconciled yeah no longer being able to engage civilly as he says to his ex-wife and then of course she in, in all of the coverage of her death once it was uh outed by radar online by the way a publication um started with some investment from jeffrey epstein okay cool uh that's real (laughs) um uh once it was reported like basically every headline included clint's name yes which yeah sucks something that she i believe expressly said that she hated about having been involved with him right um so 
you know, he couldn't have known that she was literally had not died when they shot the movie. But right. it, it's easy to imagine that that is Something even in the deep recesses of his yeah, mind that he, he's not not fully acknowledging correct. himself. Yeah. When he is drawing from subconsciously yeah. trying to act and to express his his repentance, that's maybe part of it. Right. Because, you know, the the in in all the press and the press material for this film the most he will say about it is like i thought this was an interesting script and at one point he right. says you know i'd go see this movie <laughs> we love you that's how Mr. Much he's, yeah yeah that's how much he's publicly engaging with i really yep. really love all that stuff that aspect but is great please when when juror number two is coming up please do not discuss the film too much <laughs> mr eastwood we no. beg you no nope. um uh but yeah, I mean this this is like a more nuanced version of the kind of father film we've gotten a million times. Yeah. And even, you know, what he says in the courtroom at the end is yes. I just wish I could buy more time. Couldn't buy anything. Or could buy anything, couldn't buy more time. Which combines two of Clint's favorite artistic themes. Uh maybe unintentionally, maybe intentionally, doesn't matter addressing like real issues with the carceral system uh including the fact yeah. that you know like stealing time from particularly elderly people shout out to uh the releasing aging people's project i think it's called rap um yeah yeah it's such an effective thing all the people on the dea side including bradley cooper clearly look like uh, they have misgivings or are just straight up embarrassed that he is being you know charged as like a drug criminal because they all recognize that he is an old yeah. man and Ladies yeah, and gentlemen, we got him. Type exa stuff. Exactly, and it's it is yeah. so inherently sad to see somebody go into prison, at, maybe with an implied death sentence. So I think yeah. you're right. We should say of that that scene at the end. Very funny that he just says guilty like while his lawyer is talking. <laughs> yes. Can't wait for juror number two. Just getting nope. me so oh, excited. Yeah. For oh yeah, this is like French court um, here. Exactly. Um, Anatomy of a Fall type uh -huh, type correct. stuff. Did yep. you see that movie? I just saw it. Yeah. I cannot believe that French lawyers are allowed to be that <laughs> fucking nasty. Yeah. Like I he's such a little bitch. Yep. The other like yep. I, I I don't have any other word for it. He's like, you want to smack him? He's like uh -huh. he's like a brat. And it and I was so just reading. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just reading Twitter exchanges about it. Seems like people were endorsing this as an accurate representation of French court. I hope that's true. That's crazy. Yeah. Is that enough father stuff? I think so. Much? I think so. Can we talk about podcaster representation on screen? I do want to talk about podcaster representation. Shout out to Eugene Cordero. Hell yeah. As Luis Roca. Uh-huh. Now, this is maybe the first podcaster that I know of who is in a Clint Eastwood movie. I wouldn't be surprised at all to learn that like Francesca Eastwood has a podcast about wellness or something. Sure. But... And Ricky Lindholm, frequent podcast guest on your CDRs. Oh, right. Right. But... No, they had a podcast as well. Oh, they did? Um, she uh... and I think she and she and Garfunkel. Uh, Kate McCushy had yep. a podcast about like being a struggling actor or something. Okay. That might be right. But uh, it's been a while since, been a while. since we had a podcaster <laughs> represented yeah. uh, on the screen here. And Eugene Cordero has worked with the best. He's worked with Clint Eastwood. He's worked with King Kong. Yep. Exactly. Yep. These all-time Hollywood big hitters. Donkey Dad himself. Yep. A very funny man. Uh, yeah. I, I do think it's very interesting to have included, it seems like I would assume just because of Eugene Cordero being, like they wanted Cordero and then they changed the character slightly to make him, him make Filipino. sense yeah maybe to but. have him be filipino but it, what's very you know what resonant about his filipino heritage first of all this is unrelated but they've the way that they've made him up and and costumed <laughs> him in this film i don't have any other explanation i i can't like expand on this he looks like an nft <laughs> He looks like he looks like all the stuff has been added to him. But he but look, sort of like folks, a paper doll. If you haven't seen the film, Jake is exactly right. I'm not laughing. I, this like, is a ridiculous idea. His his necklace does look somehow added. Like after. his hair looks like a like a Lego <laughs> piece that was yeah. just plopped onto his hair his head. Yep. But he explains that he's he's not even like he's explicitly Filipino in the in the the film, and this is 
particularly interesting because it points to this this is like one of the origins of the american extractive empire i was gonna say well both spanish and american extractive empire yes in relation to mexico in the philippines yeah you also have you know at the time like there's there's a a great book that i'm reading about smedley butler called gangsters of capitalism Mm, i mean this is like where where capital and and uh gangster behavior are are the closest and the and the most like uh difficult to to disentangle is and, is in like robber baron kind of uh uh early 20th century late 19th century um sort of business empire territory like in in the philippines and there's a bunch of great contemporaneous articles uh and essays because this was the point where people were very explicitly identifying that the u.s was violating its own principles and not allowing people self-determination right so people at the time of the philippine occupation were saying like look your entire country is founded on one thing you are so clearly going against that in saying that you know better for us so this is like early neocon questions right about how how much the u.s can impose its will right if the entire point of the u.s in the way that even like marx admired you know was that they were supposedly the ultimate self-determination land further connection to the philippines Uh uh-huh the vfw Uh uh-huh was founded by veterans of wow interesting uh specifically both the, well, the Spanish American War generally, I think there were two different organizations: one for veterans who'd fought in the Philippines, and one for veterans who'd fought in Cuba. And then they sort of merged together. Wow. The VFW, a very weird organization. Yeah. Oh yeah. Difficult for me to sort of even figure out its relationship to the U.S. government, mm-hmm. its sort of official status. It is nominally, you know, it, it uh, directs veterans toward services and provides like kind of a social space for them as well. Yeah, it's also like in the vein of like Elks clubs type stuff. Yeah. It's also kind of a fraternal organization, but a couple weird things about them. If you can believe it, they (sighs) did not let Japanese American veterans into the VFW. And then this led to 14 Nisei VFW posts, like basically self-segregated posts being opened, which is really weird. Mm -hmm. Also, they... Uh, the VFW initially refused membership to Vietnam veterans uh, because basically everyone in the VFW was World War II and Korean War veterans. Right. There were there were sort of a combination of reasons provided. One was that Vietnam was technically a police action and okay, yeah, yeah, of course, not a war. Which mm-hmm. but so was Korea. But then also, at least according to a, a, an un, an unsighted sentence on Wikipedia, uh-huh. uh, also many World War II veterans blamed Vietnam vets for losing the war. Wow. They wouldn't let them in. What which, a weird who knows. position. But as a result, basically, all these posts are dying off with the, the vets who were members of them. And it's apparently hard for uh younger vets coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan to uh want to go hang out with a literal 95 year old. Sure, of course. Um, yep. So the VFW is kind of falling apart it seems like. But um yeah, I like interesting that that it's connected to the the Philippines so directly. It it is and this was totally new information for me. Uh nice digging. This was I was Thank just you. thinking about this because we've seen the VFW. I think we get it at least in Million Dollar Baby, right? I forget what else maybe if we've seen it uh, explicitly elsewhere. I think Million Dollar Baby and I think it's maybe mentioned in Gran Torino? Yeah. Oh, I think I think that's right. And that we get gunnies which i couldn't tell if that was a reference uh buddy i've got gunnies for you okay and we also get sort of like i mean it's polka music but we finally get clint eastwood dancing again which which yes. recalled like old palomino honky tonk men scenes so it felt like With there's a lot of molly b yeah exactly a lot of reprises going on here i don't know what you thought about this from her website in 2018 molly b and squeeze box uh-huh. appeared as molly b and her band in a scene of the warner brothers movie the mule directed and starring clint eastwood yep this is direct this is ripped from her website Mm -hmm. in this scene molly plays piano trumpet sings has one line and dances with clint eastwood additionally Mm -hmm. molly and ted lang co-wrote the song they performed which was pre-approved by clint eastwood which we know (laughs) means he said "Eh, it's fine (laughs) Uh, molly wrote the instrumental part and the chorus and ted wrote the verse gotta say this is among the worst songs i've ever heard in my (laughs) entire life i thought it was 
like a joke for a little bit, a brief second, because it's yeah. so insane. It's like, thank you and smiles to the best people in the world. It is time to <laughs> say thank you, like that kind of shit. Um, yeah. So, uh, she's Molly B. Seems she comes from a a uh, like a whole a polka performance family from okay. from Wisconsin. All right. She's got extensive training and experience as a, a performing musician. She she has a, I think some kind of like a professional degree or a, a graduate degree in trumpet. Like she's a real uh-huh. deal. She's had a bunch of um regular like uh uh public television shows in wisconsin of uh, playing polka music in 2018 molly was the youngest person to be inducted into the into the international polka hall of fame and she had a u.s flag flown in wow. her honor by the u.s air force in a mission in the middle east holy That's all she shit said on her website. this is fascinating Very strange. fascinating yeah stuff. just don't this is a whole whole world out there but yeah. this is also the kind of thing where clint's not looking down on this stuff like nope. this nope. is truly he has re he's like revitalized this tiny community space yeah with his drug money yep um also about gunnies that yeah. seems to be fake maybe a sort of a joke by the production designers that's not a real chain but there is in the philippines a restaurant called gunnies all american burger house okay. burger house is all one word all right like Bauhaus, Burger House, cool. Exactly, it's in Bacolod in okay. the Philippines. I have some, I have some menu for you. Hold All on right. a second, let me Hit see me. if I can pull up menu here. All right, so we've got a number of burgers, including the Gunner Burger, the Undertaker Burger, the Big Show Burger, the Ultimate Warrior. But we're getting into some professional wrestlers. Yep, undoubtedly. Uh, the Marine Burger, the Super Max Burger. Carceral state uh-huh. rearing its ugly head. ADX burger. Yeah, we've also got American spaghetti. Because <laughs> okay. uh, I know that in the Philippine spaghetti involves uh, cut up pieces of hot dog. Yes, and I believe ketchup, it's extremely I believe. sweet. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. There's also banana ketchup, which is made from uh-huh. bananas right. instead of tomatoes because more plentiful. Have not tried it. Keep asking my Filipino coworker to bring some to work, and he has been forgetting. Will not. But that's okay. He's yeah. He's busy. They also seems to they seem to have Pepsi products there. Um, okay. And uh, lumpia lumpia buffalo chicken. Interesting. Kind of interesting to think about. Yeah. But it seems to be on a base, an American base. Ah, uh, of course. Uh, okay. Philippines. Wow. So Philippine connection uh-huh. throughout. So that's kind of the Philippine corner. Uh, Lauren Dean is back from yep. in line of fire, looking, looking his years. I would say, yeah. Um, no offense, that's okay. He was kind of like a cute boy, uh-huh. so it makes sense that he would be visibly not a cute boy. Uh, Clint has two threesomes in the film. Not really worth. We have to just briefly say that I think it's fascinating. It was so talked about. It was one of the only things I knew about this movie. It's made yes. up. It's the the way people talk about it is like it's like a central part of the film, or no, it's, or it's somehow like trying to revive his old school sex symbol. I feel like it's the exact opposite. This to me was like an effective inversion of Clint Eastwoodness because he is so frail in these scenes. I mean, he's right. horny, but. He is like yeah. so clearly the like uh, maybe not full on submissive figure, but the like the one with inferior power in these scenes. Right. Well, he's there's these women who are just doing things with their hips that seem impossible. Yeah. I mean, I think they're all sex workers as far as we can tell. Uh, and we, yes. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be dehumanizing them. I don't think. No, they seem to be having an okay time. Yeah. There's some. Just the, the, the amount of butt shots in this film, I think, yeah. at least puts Clint in the running for directing... A Fast uh, and the Furious film? Fast X2. Yep. Has yeah. to be. Has to be. Has to be. The, it's really funny when he's going to a, a room in, in uh, Andy Garcia's mansion uh-huh. with uh, one of the ladies, and he's so old that the first thing he says is, oh, the room's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and then he gets on the bed and takes his shirt off and he's yep. like some heart medicine might be good uh-huh. uh, i need to call a cardiologist exactly. dr clark yeah he gives them the name of yeah, his cardiologist really, really funny but then he also has uh while he's being surveilled he has a uh threesome in a motel uh-huh. uh, including shout out to caroline avery granger as hot 45 year old i also saw that on imdb bizarre 
I mean, true, maybe, but there's also a lot of like dancing, you know? yeah. which is both cute and is like dancing as old man foreplay which i think is very funny yeah and then the women leave the motel room in the morning and seem to they're sort of laughing about like i can't believe we did that yep. uh but you know we're, we had a nice time yeah i don't know i guess uh, i was assuming that it was like played very seriously given how people responded to it and it seemed i don't know it seemed to understanding of the joke a, on many levels yeah. and a, an indication of his failings as a family man but yeah. also maybe what drew him to the road and right uh, yeah part of part of this like manufacturing uh, like support or uh, admiration in people outside of his home exactly all right so then you know then he's sent to jail don't let the old man in the song by toby keith which was Correct. inspired by uh clint's motto when when toby keith was at a, a celebrity golf tournament in pebble beach in 2018 and clint said i'm turning 88 and soon and, and he says uh, what are you doing for your birthday and he says i'm making a movie he says how do you do that how do you how do you st- keep all this energy or whatever mm-hmm. and he says i get up in the morning and i don't let the old man in yep yep and so toby keith wrote this song it's uh, sounds more than not a, not a ton it's pretty bad it reminds me of maybe it's time to let the old ways die which is of course the film that we keep From talking about S- the star is born yeah. yeah i mean maybe it is mm-hmm that's what uh, Kylo Ren taught us. <laughs> That's or right. Yeah. I did want to say mm-hmm. a couple of things. Okay. All violence produced by the drug war is the direct result of U.S. drug policy. Correct. Yeah. All drugs should be legalized and regulated yep. and rendered as safe as possible. If you choose to use drugs and you haven't done so already, you probably have because if you're listening to the show, you're very smart. Among <sighs> the smartest people of all time. Mm-hmm. Go check out harmreduction.org. Yep. Lots of resources for fentanyl test strips and uh, Narcan resources mm-hmm. and all kinds of stuff. Make sure you can use safely and hopefully... Party safe out there, folks. Be around a, a good safe site where you're, where you're getting both support for safe use and resources for if you want to stop using drugs. But really, if you are listening to this podcast, you should just direct your cool friend to that website because <laughs> yeah. you're a huge fucking loser yeah. and you wouldn't even know where to get cool drugs yep. if you tried. That's right. But uh, be safe out there and uh, uh, fuck the war on drugs. Yes. You can say comfortably. Correct. Yeah. All basically, I mean, drug crimes are not the only crimes that the cartels engage in, but almost all the crimes they engage in are related to communities experiencing poverty or inequality and... Uh, that so clearly seems to be the thing we have to address before we are criminalizing people for drug use. And some drugs are legal and yep. uh, some of them are cool also. Uh-huh. Yeah. Some, I, as a person who has done not that many drugs, but some drugs, some of them are just fine. Nothing that bad happens. Exactly. Except weed. Because <laughs> weed makes me really embarrassing. Yep. And I'll just say things like, this is awesome uh-huh. out loud. And then yeah. I'll just get laughed at for <laughs> months. <laughs> That uh-huh. is about going to be our episode on The Mule, and I uh, thank you for listening to it. I thank you for joining us in our Lincoln Mark LT. Oh, yeah. Any final thoughts, Ian? Uh, nope. We are the Leo Sharps running cargo of uh, valueless drugs. Nobody has yet uh, rewarded us with any money in the glove box, but we're going to just keep making these runs. This podcast is nothing if not narcotic. Uh-huh. <laughs> Exactly. We keep we will keep poisoning the cities of the United States with our uh, material, our output. The wastewater is unsafe. Yep. Thanks everybody for listening. Remember to subscribe, rate us, write a review. It helps us on the algorithm. If you like the show, tell a friend, tell your dad, text uh, Saul Huezo. Uh, mm-hmm. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Podcasty for me. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Clint Eastwood podcast. You can email us at podcastyforme at gmail.com. We have a Patreon where we talk about other kinds of shit. Patreon.com slash podcastyforme. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. Next week, we're talking Richard Jewell with two of the best in the business. That's right. John Hamm and Olivia Wilde will That's be joining us. Just right. kidding. They're even better looking uh, Aaron and Carly from Hit Factory Podcast will be joining us. It seems impossible, but we did it. We got the two more handsome people in this world. They're, you, they're keeping up with the Joneses too mm-hmm. is going to be Gal Gadot and, and John Hamm being uh, terrified and impressed by exactly. Aaron and Carly from yep. Hit Factory. That's exactly correct. And that's real and it's from Deadline.com. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you, Ian. And with that, uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to let the old man in. I'm doing it.